Wow. We've all descended into a hushed silence. The anticipation is palpable. Should we get started? Are we ready? Yeah? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Come on, I know it's Sunday morning. I know some of you hit it hard last night, but you can do better. Good morning, everyone. That's the spirit. Great to see you all. Um, All of you here in Oxford, all of you joining in from around the world, uh, whether this morning or later on, um, from our Map the System uh, community and our Global School community. Welcome to the global final of Map the System. 2023. My name is Peter Droback. I'm the director of the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship. And on behalf of um, our wonderful team, on behalf of Said Business School, the University of Oxford, and all of our partners, um, we're really excited uh, to have you with us today and grateful to you uh, and excited about, about what's to come. Uh, most of you know this, but Map the System is a is a global learning program and social innovation competition that is transforming the way that we teach problem solving um, within higher education and equipping a new generation of leaders with a systems thinking mindset to reshape our world. And Map the System is now about eight years old um, and it started small and it started with just kind of this stubborn feeling of discomfort with the way that a lot of business plan competitions and innovation competitions were evolving. We saw some challenge with that and some opportunity. Too much of what we were seeing was sort of informed heavily by a Silicon Valley model of entrepreneurship. And we thought, well, uh, you know, maybe we need to move away from a move fast and break things mindset to a move together and build things mindset. Maybe we don't necessarily want to cultivate or encourage Uh, the kind of heroic, worshipped entrepreneurs. Maybe we don't want to replicate Elon Musk's and Mark Zuckerberg's for social good. No offense, hashtag cage match, hashtag toxic masculinity. (laughs) Maybe we need a different kind of leader. Maybe we need to move away from the leader as the command and control, the orchestrator. Think about the orchestra conductor, keeping everybody exactly in line, following with perfect conformity, and moving to a kind of leadership that might be a little bit more like uh, the leader of a jazz band, what Charles Mingus called comprovisation. We start from a sort of a hymn sheet that gives us a direction of travel on what we're going to be playing together, but then that's informed and shaped by our individual and collective imagination and improvisation and the act of creation and learning together to create something truly new and special. And, and that's all informs the way we think about Map the System, which is really about developing a skill set for a different kind of innovation, right? Um, So taking nothing away from the sort of technological innovation and such that we see with Silicon Valley, but an innovation that's rooted in systems thinking principles, which comes from a whole variety of disciplines across the sciences, which comes from indigenous traditions of wisdom, which comes from histories of struggle to expand rights and opportunity from the generations that came before us. And we call it a collaboration because it's really more about a learning program and to learn by doing and learn by exploring to address issues you care about. Um, and the competition framework brings us together and builds some excitement. And you know, this year we're, we're really excited that we have uh, over 60 university partners around the world and over 3,000 students um, and other colleagues who participated in Map the System this year. Um, so there, there is a competition element to it, but it's a collaboration. I wrote down actually, I thought I invented the, the word, it turns out I didn't. It's in the Urban Dictionary, which if you may know is not a real dictionary, uh, but the definition according to the Urban Dictionary is a means of kicking butt in the workplace and in life by using competition to foster collaboration. So that's what we're trying to do today. Um, So looking forward to it, out of those hundreds and hundreds of student teams around the world, uh, we had the really difficult task of of meeting with and hearing from uh, the winning team from each of those institutions back in May, um, and 17 incredible uh, teams of students and collaborators have joined us here over the last week in Oxford for a really phenomenal week of of learning, and uh, and today we're going to hear from the, the last six. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the details of how the competition is going to go today. Um, so here's our schedule. Um, if you haven't seen it already, we're doing the welcome.
welcome and introduction now. We're gonna have two rounds of presentations. So out of the six teams, we'll do three presentations with their Q&A. We'll have a nice break over lunch. We'll come back together and have the second round of presentations along with some fantastic uh, speakers. And, uh, and then while well, the judges deliberate, uh, and then finally we will uh, announce our prizes. Um, and there are several. Um, so it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, it's a full day, uh, but it's gonna be an exciting and robust and generative day. And we are looking forward to uh, to all of it. Uh, this is the presentation schedule for today. I'll, of course, be introducing them as they come, uh, but uh, let's uh, run through it again. In the morning, we have the University of Haifa. We have National Taiwan University. We have the American University in Beirut. These, by the way, of course, are in no particular order. Uh, and in the afternoon for the second session, we'll have our friends from Vanderbilt University, followed by Wesleyan, and then finally, um, Athabasca University. Um, so before we move any further, let's just give uh, those six teams another round of applause and encouragement. Uh, and at this time, to really kick us off, it is my pleasure to introduce my uh, colleague, co-conspirator, thought partner, uh, Mariah Besharov. Mariah, some of you met early in the week, is a uh, professor of organizations and impact here at Said Business School and is also the academic director of the uh, school center. Uh, she has had a, a long and storied career having studied sociology and organizational behavior at Harvard, an MBA from Stanford, and teaching and researching and, and, and really developing an incredible body of work at Cornell University before joining us here in Oxford a few years ago. And of course, for the last two years has been a really critical part of our work at the School Center. Um, she had the misfortune of having to attend a and speak at an important conference in Sardinia, Italy of all places. And we're, you know, we, we, uh, our, our condolences go out to you, Mariah, for having to spend the last couple of days on an island in southern Italy. But fortunately, she's back for the big final. So please welcome Mariah Besharov. Thank you, Peter, for that lovely introduction. And good morning to all of you. I'm really honored and delighted to be here to welcome you to the Map the System Global Final. Students, educators, partners, School Center staff, and our global online audience, welcome to all of you. Some of you are deeply familiar with the School Center and our work, but many are new to our community. So I'm gonna say just a few words about what we do and the special role that Map the System plays for us and for the community in developing the next generation of systems leaders and of systems educators. The School Center was founded 20 years ago in a pioneering partnership between the School Foundation, and we're honored to have Claire Wathen from the Foundation here with us today, and Saeed Business School. The Foundation at the time placed a bet on Saeed as a young business school, just about five years old when the center was founded, a young business school with the potential to really transform management education, to put impact at the core of management education. And in many ways, we've succeeded over the past two decades, working together, not succeeded alone, but working together with a global community of funders, of higher education institutions, faculty, staff, practitioners, and students. We've collectively built the fields of social innovation, entrepreneurship, and impact. These ideas and practices have spread not just in the social sector, but also across the corporate world and into the halls of government. And our students, the leaders of tomorrow, those of you here in this room, those of you watching online, those of you who've participated in the program this year and across all the years we've run it, increasingly you want to put social entrepreneurship, innovation, and impact at the heart of your careers. We hear you saying you want the tools to address systemic problems, whether you're going to work in business, in government, or in nonprofits. And as we've built this field, we've learned a lot on the journey, in the process. Perhaps most importantly, we can see now more than ever that innovative solutions to the complex social and environmental problems we're facing depend not just on special individuals or hero entrepreneurs, as Peter has mentioned, or on clever business plans. They require, really at their foundation, a deep understanding of systems. 
the systems of relationships, of power, of resources and values that are at the heart of today's challenges, but equally at the heart of tomorrow's solutions. And we need the ability to shift these systems to catalyze positive social change. But shifting systems, as I think you've all started to experience through the program, is really difficult work. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen through isolated action by one individual or one organization. It's an ongoing process, a collective process that involves working across divides together to shape a better future. And I've seen this in many ways. I want to share a little bit about how I've seen this in my own work and my own research. A project I'll tell you a little bit about that I started when I was based at Cornell University. And those of you who are in the academic world of research will know, uh, or won't be surprised to know that this is still ongoing research. It was started many years ago. It's been a multi-year study of organizations called food hubs. Food hubs work to address issues of health and environmental sustainability by trying to revitalize local food systems. And they do this by serving as aggregators, distributors, and marketers of local food, supporting small-scale, sustainable growers and making fresh, healthy products accessible to consumers who otherwise wouldn't have access. But they can't do it alone. They're intermediaries in a complex web of relationships between suppliers, including independent farmers and value-added producers, but also national and global agribusiness, and buyers, local consumers, restaurants, retailers, and anchor institutions like school districts and hospitals, as well as national and global buyers and wholesalers, food service management companies, and so on. And this web of relationships in which they're enmeshed involves players with often divergent, certainly different, but often divergent interests and objectives and resources. And as I've been studying hubs largely across the United States, in the inner city of Philadelphia, in rural Colorado and New Mexico, in northern New York State and other locations, I've seen how they carefully build ties with existing well-resourced players, recognizing, for example, that contracts with global food service management companies, often seen as antagonistic or not aligned can actually help them reach people in schools and prisons and healthcare systems who otherwise wouldn't have access to fresh, healthy foods. And equally, I've watched these hubs forge relationships with more value-aligned but also often resource-poorer partners, local farmers and retailers, recognizing that collectively these partners could help them develop new practices, wield new forms of power that could help to make small-scale sustainable production and local food access viable again. And all of this work that these hubs are engaged in in this web of relationships requires two things, and these are the kinds of things we aim to teach and map the system. Understanding the existing set and system of relationships, power, resources, values, and practices and then, and really importantly, bringing together individuals, organizations, and institutions across differences in resources, interests, and objectives in order to challenge and shift those systems. And here at the School Center, that work, the mindsets, the skill needed to do that work is what we aim to do, is what we aim to equip leaders of tomorrow with. We want to help people learn to embrace paradox, to work across theory and practice, to navigate tensions between profit and purpose, to understand the systems that are holding us back, and transform them into systems that can take us forward. We ground our work and this work of understanding systems in insights from research and practice, and especially from insights that emerge when we put research and practice in conversation. Map the system really exemplifies this mission. We draw on research and practice and those insights to develop a, a set of learning experiences, a program, uh, and the competition along the way that helps all of you students and participants analyze systems, the relationships, the power dynamics, the practices, the values at the heart of those systems, at the heart of a community, and identify opportunities for tipping or shifting the system to catalyze change. Many of you have told us, many participants, that we hear the experience changes the way you see the world. And since the program was launched in 2015, we've reached a cumulative total of nearly 15,000 participants. That's 15,000 people who now see the world in a different way, through a systems lens. 
15,000 people who are using systems thinking to catalyze systemic change on the issues they care about the most. This year, as Peter has mentioned, we had more than 3,000 students participating, representing over 60 partner universities. And today and across the week, we've brought together the top teams representing students and educators from 17 universities, teams from Argentina, Canada, Czechia, Egypt, Ghana, Israel, Mexico, Nepal, Lebanon, Taiwan, the USA, and the UK. The projects span a really interesting, impressive, and exciting range of issues and topics, from infertility care in Kathmandu Valley to exclusion of transgender women from the workforce in Argentina, from the e-waste crisis in Ghana to child marriage in Indonesia, and 13 other equally interesting, important, and compelling challenges that you've heard about across the week. We've supported these finalist teams across this past week, not only to develop and polish their presentations and their projects, but also and especially, and maybe more important, to focus on the future, considering how to take their work forward and to translate their new systems thinking toolkit into action. We've also worked with the educators, the faculty and staff from each participating institution who guide and support the student teams. Uh, we've had the pleasure, the privilege to engage and learn from all of you through dedicated sessions that have helped us and will continue to help us build a community of practice to share learnings about how to teach systems change going forward. And today, we get to hear from the six finalists who are competing for first, second, and third prizes. We'll evaluate these projects and these presentations based on the depth of understanding of your chosen problem area, the analysis of existing solutions, impact gaps, and opportunities for positive change. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being part of our collective mission of catalyzing systemic social change, and good luck to the finalists. Thank you, Mariah. OK, what's next? Before we get to student presentations, we need to introduce our judges, right? Uh, those of you here met them yesterday. Um, they are an esteemed group of, uh, of practitioners, of academics, of designers, uh, of network and ecosystem gurus, uh, some former participants, um, et cetera. I'm, I'm not going to do all of your bios. I'm just going to introduce you and ask you all to stand up. Uh, we, have, uh, we have Tanya Aratau, Steve Whitla. Stand up. We'll do applause all at once. Karen Cridge. Rasheen Dillon, Claire Wathen, Darshan Sangrauska, and Zaid Hassan. As you learned yesterday, they are really tough, mean folks. They're going to really, no, I'm just kidding. They are going to push you, but in a good way. Um, we're, we're really grateful. There's a lot of work, actually, you know, judging. We spend time uh, reading through, alongside these brief presentations we're going to hear, teams have put together these very robust reports with detailed maps, et cetera. And so um, all of the judges invest a lot of time in preparation and in giving really thoughtful and probing feedback as well. So we're grateful to the judges today. One final thing, you'll, we'll have a, hear a lot of gratitude. Um, um, throughout the course of the day today because you know there are so many people and partners who make Map the System possible. Um, what I'd like to do at this time is to acknowledge a couple of the key partners um, who have indeed made this possible. Our friends at the Skoll Foundation, which Mariah mentioned, who have been um, with us every step of the way for the last 20 years. And one of the great things that the Skoll Foundation has allowed the center to do is to experiment and try new things and build things and, and back us in those ways and map the system all the way through these years uh, would not be what it is today uh, without them. And we hope it's making a small contribution to the foundation's incredible work of uh, you know, building a, a, a sustainable world of peace and prosperity. And they're a true ecosystem actor. Um, and Claire is representing the Skoll Foundation today, so I'm going to make her stand up one more time.
And uh, in a wonderful new partner uh, this year as well, Atco. Atco is a company from Canada, and you'll, you'll learn more about them uh, later when we hear from uh, George. But we're incredibly grateful that this very progressive leader of a really interesting company is not only supporting um, the robust program of Map the System in Canada with our friends at Mount Royal and across, um, across that great country, but also as a sponsor of our global final today. We'll hear from uh, George Continescu uh, later today, but please, George, stand up and uh, thank you. Okay, you sick of me yet? Should we get started? Um, so we're going to, again, have three rounds. Sino is going to help us get our slides ready. Uh, we will be kicking off the first uh, student team presentation with the uh, Haifa University. Come on down, please. Hello all, and uh, thank you for the opportunity and for this stage. Our mapping focuses on the underrepresentation of Arab-Israeli tech entrepreneurship in Israel's startup nation economy. But let's start with the fact that the world is not perfect. Sometimes we come across a problem that requires correction. And the first thought is, it's too big for me. I'm too small to make a difference. It holds, it's, it, we also felt like that until we've met. We are from the Middle East. Complexity is our middle name. Before we begin, we would like to introduce our team. We are a truly unique group. We are Jewish and Arab Israeli team working together, a rare event in Israel nowadays. And we became friends. Moreover, we all hold influential positions that can make a real difference. Our project didn't stay only within the boundaries of the academia. Our mapping efforts have uh, gained significant recognition through appearances on media, policymakers, and entrepreneurship forums in Israel. Throughout our mapping process, we have conducted interview and advice with more than 100 change agents from diverse stakeholders. We have taken the important suggestions from these stakeholders and used them to improve our work, make it even better and more relevant. Israel is a startup nation. We are one of the largest hubs in the world generating tech companies. When we say unicorn, we refer to a startup company worth more than $1 billion. When you are a high-tech entrepreneur, your opinion and actions matter. Here you can see the Israeli President Herzog playfully portraying himself as a unicorn. So where is the problem? Okay, Arab Israelis make up 21% of the population of Israel, but only 1% of the startups in Israel were established by Arab Israeli entrepreneurs. Even more alarming fact is that 50% of Arab Israelis live below the poverty line. Standing in a school center, we understand the power of entrepreneurs to impact the life of their communities. The success of individual entrepreneurs can have a positive repeal effect benefiting the entire community. The iceberg model will be the foundation of our mapping. Let's start with the event. Our event is that, again, we, Arab, comprise 21% of the population of Israel, which equals to about 1.9 million individuals. However, when it comes to high school students, only 17% of Arab students study computer science and technology. Note, in Jewish, among Jewish, it's doubled. Digging deeper into the data, uh, 
Even more alarming is that 1% of the startups are Arab-led, and just 0.1% of the total capital investment is directed toward Arab ventures. Going deeper into the patterns, despite that a decade of intervention programs, there have been no noticeable shift. To get a complete understanding of the structure, we have mapped not just the stakeholders involved, but also how they are connected to each other. We are particularly interested in understanding the power dynamic that exists within those relationships. Here you can see a comprehensive list of organizations that are involved or should be involved in this challenge. Here you, we map those stakeholders based on their level of interest in investing in the problem and their actual potential to make a significant difference. Direct your attention to the upper left side of this figure where you will find organizations that possess the highest potential to drive meaningful change. However, it is noteworthy that their current level of involvement is relatively limited. Among them, pay specific attention to family, community, and the IDF, the Israeli army. They are dormant stakeholders. Indeed, leveraging dormant stakeholders could change the power dynamics. In order to further understand the structure of our iceberg model, we've implemented a feedback loop analysis. Here we present a, sim a simplified version of the main feedback loop that partially demonstrates our finding. We spotted four, ma four main themes that serve as barriers. To understand the relationship between them, let's start from the external loop. Inefficient allocation of government investments, reinforced, the segregation which leads to constantly reliance on the government budgets. Moving to the inner circle, we see a series of positive loops that show how inefficient government funding in many levels prevent the Arab entrepreneurs from taking risk, leave them behind acquiring soft skills, and thus expand the segregation between Jews and Arabs. As a result, we can see how all those loops lead to more positive feedback that limits the Arab access the ecosystem that is presented by the most external loop. Thus, Arab are currently stick to the floor. Once, once we obtain a clear understanding of the structure that explains how this inequality in tech entrepreneur has emerged, when they focused on identifying the mental models that shape this structure. Dr. Rafiq Hajj, a successful Arab entrepreneur, has made it clear in this heartbreaking quote. The base of our problem lies in the effects of the long-standing conflict between the two peoples. We are aware that we cannot solve the whole long-standing Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but we have identified a window of opportunity where government and Arabs' economic interests meet. As we said, a decade of intervention program did not make a difference. In order to understand why, we used the impact gap canvas. We decided to show you three main gaps focused on the structural level of the system, fragmentation, vacuum, and segregation. The fragmentation of the system is expressed as many organizations not collaborate and there is no collective impact. The vacuum means that for Arab Israeli, there is no plan when arriving at the age of 18, when Jewish teens serve in the army. The army is equivalent to the college system in terms of social mobility, and the tech units are alike the Ivy League. Also, there are uh, very few joint Arab and Jewish tech programs that further deepen the segregation. One of the most striking findings of this mapping process is that funding is not the main problem. Our solution landscape identifies leverage point. Here we will demonstrate four of them with those letters. We aim to change the power dynamics by breaking the positive feedback loops.
Our solutions are based on both local and international context. To walk the talk, we must act like a startup, to be agile, to change solutions where they don't work, and first and foremost, to put our person in that center. Here are examples for social leaders we would like to promote. In terms of funding, currently Arab needs are ignored. We recommend to involve Arab entrepreneurs while considering how to direct the funding. In terms of lack of skills and knowledge, we recommend to develop a gap year simultaneously with the army uh, focuses on tech and soft skills. To encourage risk taking, we recommend to expose successful Arab entrepreneurs as role models and to reduce the segregation Governmental funds should obligate the collaboration between Jews and Arabs. You know what? Sometimes we do feel really small. Uh, if we were not part of the solution, we will remain part of the problem. Thank you all. Shukran. Toda. Toda. Thank you very much, Tim. That was fabulous. At this time, we have a 10-minute uh, question and answer period. Uh, so at this point, we'll turn it over to our judges. Hello. Thank you so much for that. Um, it seems like you have come into this process with some familiar familiarity or deep familiarity with the topic. I was really curious about outside of the funding revelation that you spoke to at the end. Um, what are some other unexpected findings or revelations, particularly from speaking with people in different parts of the system, um, and perhaps how have your own perspective shifts from, shifted from when you started in the process? Thank you so much for the question. We have uh, discussed it a lot. Uh, we went to interview the successful Arab uh, entrepreneurs, and then we uh, were surprised there is two uh, um, uh, groups of them. The one who succeed and relocate from Israel because of the sense of belonging and other uh, uh, circumstances in being Arab in Israeli. And the other entrepreneurs that succeed and want to impact their own community, so they are doing uh, establishing entrepreneur centers by them own. So speaking with all the stakeholders within the Arab community, we were very surprised to understand that those Arab entrepreneurs can assist to the uh, change in the problem with the system or can uh, really have a, be a problem in it. Because today they are mediator for the government funding. This money is not trickling down to the entrepreneurs that want to fund a, a startup. Meaning it's going uh, only to the mediators and others in the Arab society told us it's a problem that we are not part of sitting next to the table. May I add that this problem of the mediator was not written in any book or article we, uh, we uh, uh, read. So only the interviews were the blind, uh, mind blowing in this specific uh, matter. But also, I think, from our friendship, we'll, we've learned a lot. So it was, to me, it was surprising. Because you don't, like, you don't become friends. Uh, it, it's only because of the map the system. I, I just want to add that we all, kind of from the field, I myself try to rise a uh, vengeance. Uh, I try to uh, rise my entrepreneur. Uh, and I saw the, the obstacles, I saw the barriers. Also, Paula is um, actually working with uh, entrepreneurs, and some of them are Arabs, and we all like live experience. And that also works in the bank, for example. So we all like familiar with this problem from different sides of, of it. Uh, I have a question. Um, have you found that any Israeli Jewish entrepreneurs are interested in this challenge? 
Can you please repeat? Have you found any successful Israeli Jewish entrepreneurs who are, who are interested in this challenge? Yes, there is some uh, stakeholders in the larger ecosystem that want to promote it. And it's uh, coming especially from the collective impact approach. So today it's very fragmental and we need also to bring uh, uh, those uh, uh, organizations that have been on the left, the ecosystem, the financial system inside of it. So when we saw that uh, it's agenda of some, they still need like the philanthropy to be involved. I will give you an example to, to explain that. Uh, Innovation of Authority has grants. Me and Muataz, if we are, want to fund each of us a startup, we can apply for it. Now, when you get in the grant, you will be covered 50% or 75% of, uh, of, of the sum, and you need to match. As a Jewish, I have more networking, maybe I have more assets, I'm not living in poverty, and also I'm, I have investing and in capital uh, people in my community. As Arab, uh, not the family and the community can support me. The investor in the community are investing in more traditional uh, 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 issues and I'm not connected to the VCs. Now, when bringing a uh, collaboration with Edmond de Rothschild Foundation that managed to do a small pilot in that, they made the matching for those Arab entrepreneurs in order to them to step in to industry. So this collective impact, impact approach has to be done because it's not that only one Jewish uh, ex, uh, successful entrepreneur would like it. There is more system problem that we have to understand and adjust them to the Arabs. It, we, we felt that many of the solution that was until now took the uh, good uh, experience or models that work in the Jewish community and tried it to replicate them on the Arabs. It's not working that way. They have their own needs. There is a client research you should do. Also, may I add that it's not just the funding. Then um, it's so hard to make the appliance. You need to understand the language and you have so many barriers before. So you need the whole, you need help. Actually, this slide may be the best answer for the question, because if we are as Arab are not part of the, the solution, it will not work. It, it, it's the, 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 the act to, to sit with Arab entrepreneurs, Arab stakeholders, and understand the needs, the, the culture, the social needs, it will not work. So the, maybe step one of the, our solution is to, to sit through around a round table and discuss it deeply. Maybe by maybe our presentation, our mapping will will be the, the the start of it. Actually, this morning someone from the uh, Israeli Innovation Authority so called well, the me. chief scientist Sorry. of the Innovation Authority. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <Yeah. laughs> through the LinkedIn because he saw them map the system and uh, we're going to meet. We we would like to um, uh, suggest to do a small part, like maybe 30% of the funds, just do it another, differently, and see if it works. So, can I pick up on that? I mean, congratulations. That's a, just a wonderful, must really feel remarkable, and a validation of your hard work. So, really well done. I'm very curious, picking up on this point, is you've got a wonderful media profile back home, which I think allows you to talk across the divides. How are you going to use that media profile to achieve your goals? Um, I think that we managed to understand that there is no awareness about the successful Arab entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs. Even Muataz and Allah, our friends, and Richard from our team didn't knew that they, the names of them. So we really made it real research. Uh, Using our media, it's meaning that we can spark spotlights on those who impact the lives. We show the hot uh, entrepreneurs as, a, as an example because we understand when there is a poverty and there is a, a, a vulnerable population, this tech entrepreneur can shift and change all his 
uh, community. This hat founder now employee more than 150 uh, employees in his community. This founder uh, uh, made a new innovation system in order to bring food from local restaurant to the Arab homes because in Israel they don't have names of the streets. Other delivery uh, companies not going inside the villages. And this is shift the position of women inside the community because they can order food their, their family and they can go work and like not going back home uh, earlier or something like that. It's shifting not only the economic side of it, but the social side of it. I think we all agree we want to live in a country where our children are uh, safe, happy, and have good quality of services. This problem will solve also the economical side of it and the social services, because our uh, economy uh, relies on the startup nation. It's 50% of our export and fifth of our uh, GDP. And this tax money do, does the social services in Israel. As we said before, we're not going to solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem, yeah? It's only like a really, really tiny window of uh, opportunity. And we know we don't know it all. It was a um, great experience. And I think we all, all of three, and also the team back home is, uh, um, everyone feels that he wants to change and I think that this particular problem can be changed. Actually, I just, uh, our challenge is when we go back home to, to convince everyone maybe that is a shared interest for everyone almost. Uh, rarely in the Middle East we have this kind of problems that have shared interest for all. And that's one of them. So it should be, it should work. And if we did it as a team, like we are from different, different. We're, we haven't we're touched different. it yet. <laughs> we are different. <laughs> We're in really diverse. In every aspect. <laughs> but we like became a friends and we did it and we did the great work and we did it together. I was and actually perfect. You wanted to make uh, system leaders in our personal life and career in reality. I think we brought this system thinking to our teams, to our organization. It made us to bring, like you said in your session, a compass and not a map to say this is the direction. Now let's see how we go there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Haifa University. Uh, we'll ask at this time our friends from National uh, Taiwan University to come down. As they're getting set up, um, I'll ask you all to stand up. It's Sunday morning after all. Find a neighbor that you didn't uh, arrive here with and just say hello, say good morning, introduce yourself. All right, let's take our seats.
There we go. Try your clicker and just make sure you're happy with it. I tried it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So we are now moving across continents. We're shifting from discussions of young entrepreneurs to discuss creating better systems of care for our elders. And at this time, I want to welcome our friends from National Taiwan University. Hello, everyone. We're happy the elderly. I'm Jia Wei, and this is Yao Jing. What we're going to discuss today is optimal aging, create an elderly friendly environment in Taiwan. Let's take a few seconds and imagine how would ourselves be like in 2050? We may get old. Are we still healthy? Are we still happy? For me, I think I'll still be healthy, active, and happy despite growing old. However, the reality is, in the year 2050, 60% of the people in the world would be the seniors. And among all seniors nowadays, 118,000 of them die from suicide each year. And there are 55 million people living with dementia, with the majority being the senior. And the situation is really, really likely to get even worse in 2050. What about the situation in Taiwan? It's even worse. 37% of the people will be the seniors in 2050. And the dementia ratio is three times that of the one in global average. And the suicide ratio is also twice that of the global average. So how can we stop the situation from getting worse? That's when optimal aging comes in. Optimal aging deals with the capacity to beyond good health and longevity. It deals with the capacity to function across many domains. And in this project, we divide it into physical health, mental health, and social participation. It is important to know that these three dimensions are mutually affecting each other. So our aim is to find the path to optimal aging. And these are our key insights. Firstly, self-care is crucial. Secondly, optimal aging is reached if and only if seniors know their worth. Thirdly, the stereotype toward the elderly threatens their mental health. Fourthly, transforming the supportive system into a robust and resilient foundation for the elderly. In the following presentation, we're going to tell you about how we come up with these four key insights and what we can do with them. Okay, so. Here's our systems map divided into three dimensions. And next, we'll delve into each part to explain how we derive the four key insights. First of all, in the current medical system with low cost medical service, seniors tend to rely on seeing doctors to maintain their good physical health. And also they strongly resist help from non-family caregivers so that their family have to take on the responsibility to take care of them and feel stressful. So the best way to alleviate the scenario is to develop the ability to do self-care, which is beneficial for seniors, for their family, and also for the society. We also found that seniors face great transition from work to retirement, and without the mindset of continual personal development, and also without supportive friendship or neighborhood around them, they will easily shut down themselves and lose the chance to reach self-actualization, and in turn having bad mental health. The scenario will even get worse if they live in an unsafe, inconvenient environment and without enough income. Lastly, the negative stereotypes toward the elderly lead to their low self-esteem and confidence. They also tend to endure mental illness and not willing to receive proper treatment as they regard mental disorders shameful. So this vicious cycle deters the senior from reaching the shared vision of optimal aging. So the question would be how we can effectively reverse the system's dynamics. Next, we move on to levers of change and gaps. So uh, by applying system thinking approaches, we've identified eight different levers across three dimensions as presented here. We've also recognized three common gaps, including one, existing solutions focus on certain groups only, two, lack of promotion and limited resources, and three, lack of specific and well-designed measures. Let's delve into the gap by providing examples from different dimensions. So take physical health for the first gap. 
Currently, the self-care programs offered by Yangshan Foundation are primarily accessible to relatively healthy and well-educated seniors only. This is because these individuals tend to be more engaged in those programs, and consequently, the foundation unintentionally narrows down their target audience to these individuals and establishes their centers in urban areas only. Secondly, for social participation, the existing solutions are offered by community colleges, and the gap is that access to information and labour support for holding social activities are both inadequate. Thirdly, mental health. Take Yangming Senior Apartment, where students had to spare 20 hours per month accompanying the elderly as an example. The gap is that deliberately designed activities aren't working effectively, because um, those activities which involve genuine emotional exchange need to occur naturally and be better designed. So based on the three common gaps and our four key insights, here we accordingly come up with four guidelines for the implementation of our intervention. So the first one, all seniors should learn self-care and other stakeholders should provide supporting measures. And when implementing the, um, the interventions, we should ensure seniors foster a sense of self-worth. And also, ageism should be eliminated, and we should also create a more sustainable, robust and resilient supportive system through sufficient labor supply and financial stability. So next, we're going to share a plan of one of our proposed solutions to explain how we can apply the four guidelines, including the stakeholders to be involved and also the action they should take. So the, uh, the intervention we're going to share is senior reemployment. So for the first guideline, we can see that work itself is actually a good way for seniors to do self-care, as they still live a regular life and also actively engage in the society. As for other stakeholders like medical institutions, they can work with companies to provide a more comprehensive periodic health examination. For example, examining um, senior dementia. As for the second guideline, companies should design customized job positions and meanwhile ensure seniors foster a sense of accomplishment and self-worth. And we encourage social enterprises to be the first group to engage in this intervention as they normally have a more inclusive culture. And we also expect NPOs like Community College to help our elderly equipped with the skill sets needed in the workplace. For the third guideline, companies should clearly regulate rules on ageism and also foster a culture to embrace diversity. As for other employees, they should regard seniors as assets rather than liabilities. As the first step, we would suggest companies to first select some open-minded employees to conduct pilot programs and then share the successful stories with others. And the last guideline, which is a, in a much broader view to create a more support, um, sustainable supportive system. And we would encourage government to act as regulators to help companies adopt the intervention. For example, asking companies to have certain portion of senior employees. We also expect MPO to have more strategic partnership with others and even transform into social enterprises to adopt a profitable business model to ensure financial stability so that they can scale up their services and reach out to more seniors in need. So that is one of our um, proposed solutions. And in total, we um, propose 16 interventions that should all follow the four guidelines. And then in the theory of change map, we formulate a two-stage strategy. The first stage is implementable in short term and with immediate effects. As for the second stage, we'll need more stakeholders assistance, but can also create a more sustainable impact. So in conclusion, we found that the core of the system is the elderly. To develop the ability to do self-care and also creating self-worth are the key to reach optimal aging. As for other stakeholders, we should, know how to, we should still try to combat the stereotypes in society and also try to build a more robust supportive system. We hope this program could also be a reference for other countries as this system's map is not only for current elders in Taiwan. Similar problems also happen in different countries now or after. And more and more people are getting old, including all of us. It's important to know how to empower ourselves to reach the shared vision of optimal aging. After all, aging is just another word of living. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, judges, who would like to kick us off? Thanks for your presentation. Um, a question I had was about the self-care for elderly people. What age do you see that shift starting, that mental shift of self-care starting? 
Um, and thank you for your question. In fact, we think that this age for everyone is different because the essence of optimal aging is that everyone has different needs and everyone should use different methods to thrive their lives and live the kind of lives they like. And actually, self-care is something really important throughout our whole lives. We should start self-care like right now, like right after we're born as soon as we can so that we can know what we really need and to do the best for ourselves. Thank you. It just a quick follow up in the system then based on that did you find places where self carers um, could be taught at an earlier age from like say a young adolescent did you find any research on that? You mean like um, where we can implement yeah. self care? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we could um, answer this question in, um, based on our theory of change map. We want to um, de help seniors develop such ability through two stage. So first, I think we would um, teach them in a community-based, like we implement some community-based programs, and then that is the first stage. But in the long term, like Jawi just mentioned, um, such ability should be um, learned through um, in, young, uh, in young people as well. So in long term, we, want, we hope that such program could um, be educated maybe in elementary school or in junior high school. Yeah, so that would be, could be formulated in a two-stage strategy. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, guys. Hello again. Um, there's a huge amount of research that's gone on behind this, and you mentioned at the end how you're hopeful that the program you've outlined could be used in other parts of the world. I'm curious... In the other direction, the research that you've seen from the other parts of the world, were there any examples of solutions that sounded great, but then when you applied them to the context in Taiwan, you thought, actually, no, that probably wouldn't work? Um, I think we can take the physical health care system as an example because in other countries there are insurances for elderly care and long-term care. However, when we're interviewing key stakeholders such as um, lawyers or government agencies, they've mentioned about the problem that Taiwanese people are seeing this long-term care service as a social benefit and that government should offer this for free to them. So they are not actually willing willing to pay another fee for insurance. So that insurance system may be working well in other countries, but not in Taiwan. Uh, I have a question. So um, first of all, um, well done, and thank you for the presentation. I found the trends quite interesting, so um, that, was, that was good to include. But I have a practical question. So um, I'm thinking about my dad. Uh, and he probably could benefit from a lot of the programs that you potentially would run. There is no way he's going to go to them. He won't go. He's just going to be like, no, I don't want to go. <laughs> so one of the questions, I think, is that practically speaking, um, you know, the, the, the ability to access people and convince them to undertake a program is difficult. So the question I had is, how would you, you know, how do you overcome that skepticism? I think that... You know, a number of old people would have to say, if you basically came along and said, hey, we have something that's really beneficial for you, um, the practical bit of getting them out of their homes into something is, in my, my, my opinion, quite difficult. So just curious about how you might tackle that. Thank you for the question. We've actually found that also in our interview, because in the first stage we interviewed many elderly people and find that some of them really just don't want to go out of the homes and have these programs, even though we're offering like free lunch and other kinds of stuff. And But we found that they also have their needs, just maybe not the same as other people. Uh, maybe like they are lonely, feel lonely and they want someone to go into their house and accompany them. So what we, why we are going to promote like communal-based activities is because that's what like fits their need and by like community based, we can have different people which adjust different elites' needs and adjust these programs for them personally. Can, can I? No, no, no. I'm very. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was just going to ask a brief question on peer to peer support and whether, if any, that came up in your research. So, how informal education through peer networks between seniors might be a protective factor, or if that came up at all. 
So we've also um, interviewed the community colleges, and they're quite optimized about optimistic about this problem because what they've seen is that elderly people who come to their center of community colleges, they are really happy about the program. The program is started in the evening from seven to nine, and that at that time it's actually quite tiring for the elderly to have the programs, but they still really like to go there because they can learn new things. And moreover, the most important thing is that they meet new people, new friends in the community centers, and this is what we want to foster among the elderly. Um, thank you. I, I've written here that this is very detailed and a very thought through presentation, so really well done. I've really enjoyed listening to it and I appreciate the work you've done. I'm, I'm, I'm picking up on the question that is coming through around networks, because how do you find folk to bring them into the level of services that you that you want, and how do you bridge that divide that we see globally between rural and urban areas? Finding hard people who are invisible already in the system, that's what I'm trying to find out how you're going to tackle that. Um, like we still, we found many organizations already like trying to implement such um, intervention. So I think for us, what we will do is try to partner with those um, um, organizations. And like we mentioned, we, we expect Nonprofit organizations to have more strategic partnership because for now the scenario is each organization like their skill is very limited. So um, the per, um, the group they could reach out is also limited as well. So which means, for example, some of them could only like they serve the seniors in urban area, but they would neglect those in rural area. But if they could have more strategic partnership, they could know like how to scale up the services and also solve another problem is um, financial instability we face right now and also like labor shortage. Yeah, so I think um, what we would do is to engage more um, for now, maybe nonprofit organization or even private sectors. Yeah. And to add on, the access to information is really important to the elderly people and to the organizations who are doing so, because they need to know like who they're partnered up with. And we actually found a specific one called the Commonwealth for Elderly People in Taiwan. And that might be the one who we want to partner up with in the next step, because they have created a platform for sharing some common wealth and also healthy knowledge for the elderly people. So so we think that this might be the one we are going to cooperate with. Do we have time? Um, just one more question for me. On, in your research, did you come across physicians using social prescribing um, at a younger age to get people to be more resilient when they're older? So let's say I'm a 30-year-old. I've gone to see a doctor. Something's wrong. The doctor thinks, you know, with a bit of a lifestyle change, it could get better. But also, these are other things I can get tapped into these networks. Does that exist in Taiwan? Did this something that come up in your research? Yeah, um, when we're interviewing some um, doctors, they, tr they uh, mentioned that it's very important to educate these patients when they come to see them. Like no matter they are, like what their age they're in. So I think that, that is part of the things our doctors are doing, but um, still this service is not scaled up. For example, um, these patients could only receive such knowledge when they're truly in such diseases. Yeah, so um, that is also one of the gap we mentioned is lack of promotion about um, like medical knowledge or so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just curious about the background for this. Like what, how did you get into this as your area of, of study? So Taiwan is going to be a super age society in 2025. That's two years later. We're going to have 20% of elderly people in our world, in our society. So this is going to be a very, very serious problem for us. And also it's kind of personal because we all have father, mother, grandmother and grandfathers. And we want to build a supportive system that is friendly to every elderly people and also people in the society in Taiwan for every everyone. Um, I just wanted to say well done on the 2050 visioning and I always think we forget that that 30 years is the generation and so the action you do today will have that effect in a generation's time. I, I thought that was a lovely way to start. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and our third group and uh, final group for uh, the morning session is uh, American University of Beirut. Uh, please come on down, and we'll get you set up. friends to kick off. Uh, I just wanted to share a, um, a, a trigger warning. You know, many of our, many of our um, projects involve confronting uncomfortable and difficult issues. And uh, the following presentation will touch on topics of uh, forced labor and exploitation of workers, and some parts may be upsetting. So to those in the room and online, uh, please do be aware of that. And uh, with that, American University of Beirut, take it away. So we have to go to the midis for us to find jobs. Yeah, we found ourselves into slavery. They will beat us, they will kill us. There is no one to help us. We are working without payment. There is no one to help us. They don't care for what we eat. They don't care for where we sleep. So please understand us by and by. You just listen to Lucy sing about the plight that she, like 250,000 other migrant domestic workers in Lebanon under the kafala system, go through. Every week, at least two migrant domestic workers under the kafala system die to causes such as suicide, failed um, escape attempts, and homicides. The kafala system is a recruitment sponsorship system that ties migrant domestic workers to their employers, also known as kafils. Most of these workers come from Africa and Southeast Asia and are perfect targets of the system due to their sensed vulnerability. Firstly, they are women existing within communities that don't exactly seek their best interest. Also, many of these origin states are plagued by issues such as poverty, unemployment, and social unrest, forces or factors that force many of these workers to move out of their countries in search of better prospects. So it is important for us to understand that for many of these workers, migrating is not totally a voluntary decision. They are faced with deception in the face of recruitment agencies, as well as the many socioeconomic factors that force them to migrate. Due to its many instances of human rights violations, the kafala system has also been termed modern day slavery. It categorically alienates workers from their human rights and corresponding humanity trapping them in a cycle of abuse. So I'm now taking you over four different causal loops. So there have been many instances recorded of migrant workers trying an escape. And due to that fear, many kafils have been confiscating their employees' passport, which lead to the lack of mobility of these workers. Furthermore, the kafala system is based on a system of dependency, where the workers do not only depend on the employers for wages, but also for food, health, accommodation, and more. Due to that, there is a power imbalance embedded into the kafala system, and which is often exploited by the kafils, which leads to the vulnerability of these workers. Another aspect of the power imbalance and the exploitation of that power is the physical and emotional abuse that follows it. That physical and emotional abuse is always leading to the fear of resistance of these migrant workers, their fearing resisting and speaking out about their conditions. Finally, with no proper legal representation and no government intervention, Agencies are, for the most part, unregulated. What that means is that they're able of getting away with not paying the wages in time or paying them at all, which leads to financial insecurity of the workers. Now, to our iceberg model, we were able to identify events which are apparent to everyone. Firstly, there's a high inflow of domestic migrant workers into Lebanon. There's an imbalance of power that definitely exists within the system and corresponding factors like low wages or even no payment of wages. However, we discovered that the trends and patterns within the system, such as financial insecurity, as well as the system structures which reinforce these trends and patterns, are all a consequence of deeply rooted mental models that make the kafala system an exploitative and abusive one. 
This includes social classism, patriarchy, a culture of silence, and the normalization of violence and racism. We discovered through our mapping process that another factor that makes the kafala system even more complex and complicated is the invisibility of domestic migrant workers. This invisibility is caused by the nature of their work, which keeps them locked up in the private sphere, locked up in the kafil's home and away from the public eye. This um, invisibility further nourishes the power of the kafils, enabling them to keep on abusing workers without any fear of public repercussions. So the kafala system is influenced by a complex and interconnected network of stakeholders. A vast majority of the Lebanese kafils, at around 94%, actually admitted confiscating their employees' passport, while more than half of them believe that it is one of their rights under the contract. Another important stakeholder under the kafala system are agencies. Many agencies are charging outrageous fees, while, mother, while others are misrepresenting the situation and the pay in Lebanon, which lead to debt, enslavement, and forced labor. Moving on, the lack of effective laws and regulation implemented by the Lebanese government only worsens the situation. Under Article 9 of the Lebanese labor law, these people are actually excluded by the labor law and are often facing discriminatory legal action. These include counter charges of theft and extended periods of pretrial detention. Sending nations maintain an enabled pattern which entraps these workers in the cycle of abuse under the kafala system in Lebanon. Some of them have been singing the praises of these workers and labeling them economic heroes for their willingness to come and work in Lebanon in order to support their family and their home nations. Moving on to solution landscape, in 2013, the Lebanese government, in collaboration with some NGOs, established an ethical recruitment code of conduct to serve the interests of both agencies and migrant workers. However, the power imbalance between workers and agencies still allows agencies to solely seek their interests. On September 8, 2020, the Shura Council with the Minister of Labor adopted the Standard Unified Contract. This contract gave migrant domestic workers rights to a minimum wage, sick pay, rest days, and the ability to enter contract without the consent of their employ employer. This contract was, however, suspended after a month following pushback by agencies. Through our system maps and looking at the current solutions landscape, we identified that the lack of legal protections for migrant domestic workers is a major gap that exists within this system. Migrant domestic workers are categorically exempted from the labor law. This means no application of minimum wage, no days off, and overall no dignified working experience. Also, in the event of a legal hearing, no legal support in terms of certified interpreters and legal representation is provided. An effective lever of change will be to apply the minimum wage law to these workers following the International Labor Organization Convention 189 on domestic workers and providing legal aid and representation for hearings. Another gap identified by mapping major stakeholders and looking at the solution landscape is the absence of due diligence and monitoring. Both in the origin states and Lebanon, the use of unmonitored agencies for recruitment makes many migrant domestic workers victims of trafficking and eventual abuse under the kafala system. A proposed level for change will be to apply a professional recruitment system involving interviews to match the employers and the employees and ensure full mutual knowledge. Also, a government-facilitated recruitment process will break the power of agencies as intermediaries and enablers of abuse against migrant domestic workers. And lastly, setting up monitoring and evaluating bodies to ensure policies are implemented. The last gap we recognized is the lack of collaboration among stakeholders. Governments act independent of each other in drafting laws for the migrant domestic workers, creating policy silos which don't serve the needs of these workers. Migrant domestic workers also have been systematically alienated from discussions that decide their fate in Lebanon. An effective level for change will be to establish inter-union relationships between organizations in Lebanon and sending states and drive collective action in developing policies. Also, workers should be granted agency, agency by being able to form work unions and engage in discussions that serve their interests. 
by applying a system thinking approach to the issues of exploitation of migrant domestic workers in Lebanon, we have been able to see just beyond abuse by employers against workers to see the interrelatedness of forces involving other key players like agencies and governments that enabled the functioning of the exploitative kafala system. We have also been able to uncover the power imbalances that make the system most liable to instances of exploitation. So as we talk right now, there's a migrant domestic worker locked up in her employer's home and scared for her life. We hope that by employing a systems thinking approach to this problem, we can echo the voices of hundreds of thousands of other migrant domestic workers locked up across Lebanon and the MENA region to bring about a systemic change to this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'm really familiar with this topic. I'm from the Philippines and work directly with migrant domestic workers who have escaped the system by coming to the UK. I'm curious to hear from your study what you've found in terms of feasible channels for exit for people that are in that system and measures of accountability that can be used on the employer side of the system as well. Um, thank you so much for that question. So, um, Talking about channels of exit, like, like we mentioned in our um, presentation, the invisibility of migrant domestic workers is one of the most challenging factors in the system. Because while you know there's a migrant domestic worker being maltreated somewhere, many people don't have access to these workers and can help them. However, there's been more civil society organization um, involvement in such situations. Most recently, during one of our interviews with a migrant domestic worker, she shared her experience um, just like a few days before the interview, where they moved together to an employer's house and with global mobilization and just protests in front of his house, they immediately released a migrant domestic worker and was able to send him back um, to Ethiopia where she was from. So we just believe if there's more um, civil society action towards um, such issues. Firstly, like you talked about ac accountability, many of these employers will be held accountable for their actions and will finally be able to find sort of a mis means of escape for many of these migrant domestic workers. However, we know that doesn't solve the problem in itself as it doesn't uh, hold these people, uh, most of these employers, sorry, um, in the court of justice for their mistakes. So we talked about applying legal structures that actually hold employers accountable for um, violating the rights of many of these workers. Thank you. Jacob? Uh, I'm going to ask you a very unfair uh, question, and it kind of applies to, I think, everybody here. So, um, I, so the, the, the issue, obviously, is an issue of power, right? Yeah. Um, and we know what to do. So we know what to do. You know what to do, right? You've got your levers of change. You talked about you know, standard contracts. You talked about policy. Um, but it's not happening. Um, so one of the challenges, I think, with the, the systems approach in general is that we propose rational solutions to problems that are essentially problems of power. So I hear the rational solutions. I hear the what we need to do. The question is, how do we do it? So the unfair question, I think, to you is, um, Given the context in Lebanon, given the state of the economy in Lebanon, how um, how do you how do you think that those power dynamics will shift? Basically, um, because you can't just propose a rational solution and then people say that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? We didn't think of that, right? So, so how do we get how do we go from knowing what to do to actually doing it? And how do these power dynamics shift? Okay. Thank you so much um, for the question. You can go for it. Okay. So, I mean, the kafala system has been established in Lebanon for ages. We're talking from the time of the Civil War, 1975, to this point. And through our mapping process and with the current economic crisis in Lebanon, we believe this is the perfect window of opportunity to tackle the kafala system. Firstly, with the economic situation, we um, decide to go from a point of incentive in discussions with the government and major stakeholders um, because we believe their decision to rectify this um, system or eventually abolish it is based on the incentives they get from it. So uh, we decided to go from a point of both economic incentives and um, incentives with regards to the rule of law in the country. And talking first about economic incentives, Lebanon is going through 
a terrible economic crisis. We're talking about inflation rates of 150% plus. Um, and with the current crisis, the government has sought uh, loans from many international organizations, such as the IMF. And the IMF has proceeded to propose a loan of $3 billion to the Lebanese government. However, the government must go on to reform many of its systems, including its fiscal system, if it has to be able to make use of this loan. But however, we see that this system is a very um, invisible one and one with no transparency. And if the government is able to rectify, especially the fiscal system of um, the Kafala system, and they've been able to manage the inflow of migrants in and out of Lebanon, been able to know how much many of these recruitment agencies actually receive um, from these migrant domestic workers in terms of employment, they'll be able to create a more transparent fiscal policy, which we believe could be an incentive to make use of these loans from the IMF. So we see an economic incentive to the Lebanese government by changing this system within the current economic crisis. More about it, um, with, the, with respect to the rule of law, the vulnerability of many migrant domestic workers increases the crime rates in Lebanon. When many of these workers are able to escape from their employer's home, because of the nature of the system, they are automatically considered illegal residents in Lebanon. This makes them very vulnerable to sex trafficking, human trafficking along the streets of Lebanon. And so this just increases the crime rate in the country and totally destabilizes the rule of law in Lebanon. So we believe by the government changing the system, they will be able to establish a rule of law, uh, monitor crime wave like sex trafficking and human trafficking. And we believe coming from this perspective will be a nice way to initiate discussions with a major stakeholder like the government who has previously been very unresponsive to um, changing the kafala system. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I'm gonna follow that up with hopefully a slightly fairer question. <laughs> um, because Hyde's absolutely right, clearly the power dynamics, the vested interests underneath all of this make it incredibly difficult to tackle. But just stepping back from this, before you started this project, and I'm assuming you're aware of all those vested interests, how did that affect your research methodology? I'm particularly thinking, um, how do you hear from the voices underneath the rational elements of the system? Because um, you, know, you have had a change of law, you said within one month that was reversed. Like, What's going on there? Who, who do you need to talk to to find out what was really going on there? Yeah, th thank you so much. So we considered that a lot during our interview and we were persistent on hearing the voices of migrant domestic workers, giving them the chance to share their stories in the full scale of what it is. Um, because we have seen previously, for example, the standard unified contract we talked about in our presentation. During the drafting of this contract, there was no representation for migrant domestic workers. There was, however, representation for the society um, which unionizes recruitment agencies in Lebanon. And we are just looking at this unfairness. Agencies being able to create a union to foster their interests, and migrant domestic workers not being able to create unions to foster their interest. And so we're just pushing for that ability for workers to be able to unionize and um, I would say advocate for issues that personally um, influence their fate and stay in Lebanon. Um, but in our personal research um, process, we just gave many of these workers the chance to share their stories in the full light. Um, for many of these workers, it was a very emotional process and some just went on for hours, like just shedding light on the whole issue and um, sharing their personal experiences. And we decided to be conscious about that and including it in our presentations and ensuring we are reporting this, also taking into consideration the, fo the voices of many of these workers, which has unfortunately not been heard in um, ratifying the Kafala system. Building on that, um, I really appreciated how you started your presentation centering um, the voices that come through in the presentation and uh, understanding the importance of visibility. I'm curious the role of um, leveraging different parts of the system around the centers of power and if you've seen any um, parallel or you know areas of, of opportunity to help raise more visibility, shifting narrative, as well as um, thinking about the mental model behind all of these later actions that could be taken by those who have influence or power currently. Um, so yeah, um, talking about influencing the, the, the powers that be, 
it still goes back to the whole raising the voices of migrant domestic workers. And we have seen more involved by read uh, fast food civil society organizations. Um, some of them which we contacted in our whole interview process involved Cafe Lebanon, This Is Lebanon, um, Edna Legna, and these are organizations which have been actively using migrant domestic workers to be involved in acti activism against the palace system. And uh, we believe this has been able to sort of raise awareness on the whole issue and fix some power dynamics within it. Because the sad reality about the kafala system in Lebanon in particular is that many people don't know about it. You talk about the kafala system and people have heard about it maybe in Qatar or Saudi Arabia, but Lebanon is one of only two countries which have no legal protections for migrant domestic workers. However, it's the most unreported. So it's just raising more, should I say, noise about it and saying this is a reality in Lebanon and action should definitely be taken against um, the system. And we believe with more international involvement, it would be able to raise awareness on the issue, break the power um, imbalances that exist. And talking again about breaking power, imbalance, um, power imbalances, we talked about the government taking charge of its responsibility. The government should be in charge of taking charge of migrant flow in and out of the country, knowing who comes into the country, for what purposes, and who is leaving the country. However, this has been shifted to private citizens. So we believe the government taking charge of this responsibility further breaks these power imbalances within the system. Thank you. <laughs> Great job. Okay, thank you so much, American University of Beirut. Uh, this concludes our morning program. Uh, much more to come, of course, including three more terrific presentations, uh, a couple of incredible speakers, and, uh, and of course, awards. Um, so at this time, for those who are here with us in person, it's, well, for everybody, hopefully it's lunchtime. Um, lunch will be served in the dining room, uh, which is uh, where lunch was served yesterday for those who were here. We'll have folks to help guide you as you come out of the amphitheater and go back into main reception. Just walk across reception, past the big desk, and turn left. It's in the back of the building. Um, uh, lunch is served now, and it should be there until about 1 p.m. We're reconvening here at half past one. So in fact, I'll ask for 1.25, just so that we can start right on time for those who are online. Um, so please do get a delicious lunch. It's Moroccan roast chicken um, with some good veggie options and sea bass, all kinds of wonderful stuff. We eat very well here. And um, get some fresh air, because the rain has paused, and we'll see you back here at 1.25. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. We're going to start in a moment. Uh, but there's this guy who's always telling me what to do. And I just need to placate him. Um, so I want to ask something. I'm just kidding. I um, want to ask something. We're in a big room. And we're not that many. Um, so can we ask folks to move down and come a little bit closer so we can have more of a nice family feel? Um, so those seated towards the back, just come on down anywhere and just start to populate seats this way. We'll have other folks coming in for the award ceremony, of course. We have to move. <laughs> <laughs> this is a judge's request, so take it seriously. Just come on down, don't be shy. You need sheets? I'm just checking. The judges need more sheets? Scoring sheets? I don't know. Come on down, folks. Are we ready to get started? How's everyone feeling after lunch? Not too sleepy, right? Remember, when you're up here on stage, you feed off the energy of those in the audience, right? So we need all of you to bring your energy and support those who are up here. Not me, I'm fine, but everybody else. Um, so, okay, we're, let's kick off part two of, uh, of today's wonderful program. It's our um, second uh, pitch session of the day. We have three more uh, amazing teams um, that we're just getting set up right now. And let me just make sure I announce the correct one. Yeah, um, so first up, we have Vanderbilt University. Can Vanderbilt come on down and get set? Hey, welcome. Slides are getting set. You've got three microphones okay. and you have a clicker. So you can the screen just a moment. Hey, 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 oh. Hey, 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 hey. Here and here. Jackie, are you ready? Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Take your time. Uh, and we want to explain this earlier. So there are going to be a part, about 30 seconds, that we're going to turn off the lights. We hope that like people are not panic about that. So <laughs> well, it's like only 30 seconds. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So we're just waiting for our judges to get some more yep. scoring sheets on. Um, Talking to the mic, we can't hear you. Jackie. <laughs> what? Sorry? Oh, the other mic. Wait, try, try mine, because... Mike? Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, I, I, I think this one. This one is a little bit Oh, I lower. can use that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Use mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Ooh. Okay. Jackie, can you hear me? Yeah, Jackie is our amazing educator. Who is controlling the mic for us? Yeah. Who knows jokes? Jokes? Oh my god, I'm so good at telling jokes. Really? You're asking, right? I am asking. Okay. This is not going to decrease any scores. Yeah. They're going to be a little bit bad. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so here's one. 
Um, it's gonna be a little bit long, but it's something about Chinese culture, not really. So, you know, a lot of Chinese poem, people have like four lines poem. So, da 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 And it's four lines, and if you connect the four, like, four le like the first letters in the four lines, they're together actually a sentence that the author wants to hint. For instance, it could be, I really love you. And it's hidden in the poem. And actually, J.K. Rowling did the same in her movies of Harry Potter's. So can you guys try to think what she's trying to imply by seven movies of Harry Potter? Like, it's hidden in the name of Harry Potter's and could connect to a sentence. Okay, I see someone taking out the notes. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Good spirit. <laughs> Yes, the title of the books. Uh -huh. No, close. <laughs> Cheating. <laughs> okay. My kids and I are reading Order of the Phoenix right now. That's number five. Wow. Half Blood Prince is number six. Oh yeah, this is United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah, we, we're. Right, that's why. Because I'm telling this joke in the United States, and everyone was like, "Oh, I never remember the name of the books." The the movies were filmed parts of them just up the road. Um, Christ Church Dining Hall was the Hogwarts Dining Hall. Um, number, what's number seven? Deathly Hallows. Those are the hard ones. Well, those, are the, those are the movies. We're talking about the books. Yes. It's actually more complex than that. Ooh. So do you, do you guys want to know more the answer of it? Or how about a hint? Okay. Hint. How about a hint? Oh, the hint? Uh, the spirit. <laughs> yeah, so the answer is... Each book start with Harry Potter and blah, 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 blah. So if you put the first syllabus here, it's like, ha, 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 <laughs> That's the spirit, thank you. <laughs> That's good. Bravo. If, if I told that, it would be called a dad joke, but when you tell that, it's really funny. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Um, could we just get whoever's in charge of the clock to just reset it to 10 minutes, and then we'll get started. Oh my god, our time has har have already passed for four man minutes. No. We haven't started our apprenticeship yet. We're good. Okay, mm. how is that for improvisation? Let's give Vanderbilt another round of applause. Hi everyone, today we are going to share our findings on the current situation of educational support for children with chronic diseases in Nashville and how to improve the status quo. We are Team Capybara. I'm I. I'm Lan. I'm Xinzhi. And I've tutored children with leukemia for four years. I saw their struggles. And here's something that we want to show you. This is Ice Memory in a Normal Day in 2020. What follows is a dramatized version of a conversation that happened in an online tutoring session between I, who's a volunteer teacher, and a seven-year-old girl who has leukemia. Today, let's talk about animals. What's your favorite animal? I like lepers. Is it because they run really fast? No, it's because they're solitary animals. Wow, I didn't know what solitary animal was when I was your age. So why are solitary animals the best? Because they can be happy without having friends. Mm. But having friends is a good thing. You can play together, right? <laughs> but I don't have hair. This is a mirroring of how the life of ch children with chronic diseases are different from their peers. Within the four years of tutoring, I've seen many of these moments, and this is what motivated me to convene our group and study this topic. After our research, we found that in the United States, one in four children will be diagnosed with chronic diseases, 
And for those who have leukemia, they on average miss 35% of their regular school days. However, we believe that children with chronic diseases are not doomed to fall behind. As for our research method, we used a combination of literature analysis with 21 semi-structured interviews with these interlocutors. And here, we want to give all of them a big thank you, because we fully acknowledge our limitations as undergrad students who never worked closely with these children in Nashville before. But thanks to these people, we bridged the gap. And here we have the system map with four main subsystems. Patient-centered care in green, school districts in purple, and mission-driven organizations in blue, and educational research in Scion. As you can see, all different factors are interconnected in a very intricate way, but we will walk you through this map layer by layer from the root cause to levers of change. And by further using Bronfman Brenner's ecological model, we set up this diagram with the center of students with chronic diseases. The outer layer it is in the, in the diagram, the larger system power it has. And on the outer layer of macrosystem, we identified four perpetuating factors, including the social stigma on children with chronic diseases, the low expectations from educators and caregivers, the lack of prioritization of providing educational supports, and the normality mental mode of what should be a normal school way for these children to pursue. Based on the beliefs of our interlocutors and our research, we identify underfunding as a root cause. For example, when talking to a nursing director, she told us that all she had for evidence-based research on patient care is a $500 gift card. Issues around funding access, allocation, and amount serve as a driving factor behind all four causal loops we mapped out. In the first causal loop, we identify the lack of funding for patient-centered care. In the second one, we recognize the funding shortage for school district. In the third one, we recognize the lack of funding for research. And in the fourth one, lack of funding for mission-driven organizations. All four causal loops interlock and reinforce each other, together forming a large systemic vicious circle that fixes the funding shortage status quo. Here is our solution. The logic behind our solution is to break the vicious circle by targeting several gaps. As you can see on the screen, the funding gaps are marked by yellow boxes, and the targeted gaps are ma marked by orange boxes. And at this point, you might wonder, why aren't the funding gaps the targeted gaps? Isn't funding the fundamental root cause? Then why don't we just address the funding issue within the system? Now, I want you guys to take a moment and think about these three questions. How much money is enough? And where does the money come from? And can we really get money directly? For the first question, I guess it's pretty hard to answer because money is never going to be enough and there's no ceiling for social improvements. Now let's look at the source of money. If we inject money into the system that we mapped, are we taking money from another system that also needs attention? And lastly, for stakeholders who have high interest but low system power, they can't really get access to money just by asking. And this is why we didn't choose to target funding gaps. However, we believe maneuvering our existing resources is a better way of solving problems. And indeed, there are well-intended existing solutions all over the sectors. However, as lower, listed over there in the black box, there are still limitations ranging from low accessibility to lack of evidence-based implementation that hinder the problem from being solved. In our interviews, a lot of our interlocutors shared their complaints about the funding issues, and they are kind of trapped there. And now, I want to invite you guys to do this with me. Imagine your hands are like a telescope. You're looking at me, zooming in, seeing me in greater and greater details. That's great. However, can you see the people sitting next to you right now? Thank you. You probably cannot. Thanks for cooperation. Focusing too much on the issue and the work they're doing right now, they might ignore other possibilities to collaborate and improve the status quo. In fact, when we're sharing our ideas and findings on the, on the issues, a lot of the experts in the fields were impressed by saying that, wow, I never thought about that before, and that's actually going to be great. This is what we want to do here, a transformation in idea, perspective, 
as well as a better exchange and maneuver of resources. And this is what, this is what led us to come up with this model. And as uh, combined with what we talked about, about the funding issues before, we said funding is really complicated and it's simply hard to get direct fundings simply by asking. However, this does not mean we do not want to strive for money at all. So this model, creating social revenue, is the, our way of maneuvering existing resources and to create more value. And that going to provide evidence to attract more fundings, which is our step of demonstrating social revenue. So what is social revenue? As being defined of social, the definition of social value listed here, we define social revenue as the quantified social value. And I'll give you guys an example in our case to help you guys understand. So child life specialists, they could calm students down before doing MRI, and that could save the money for anesthesia. In the word of child life specialists that we interviewed, this could help to save millions of money, and actually millions of lives. Using the two-step model just mentioned, we identify levels of change that create and demonstrate social revenue. I want to share two of them with you. First, we have the Community Coalition for Mission-Driven Organizations. This prototype is inspired by the work of the charity organization Ronald McDonald House, which provides free accommodation to poor outpatient families. By talking to two house managers in Nashville House, we came to understand that they're connected with community so that a local furniture store can repair the chair for free and the local restaurants can provide free meals three times a week. We want this model to be used by other organizations to seek help in their community and find their allies. Just like in the movie Up, every community member is like a balloon, together lifting a lovely house. We also propose the ideal communication system to channel the communication between key stakeholders. For example, the hospital school teacher can talk to a general school teacher to update their learning plans expectations. As you can see, there are mutual arrows between every two parties, suggesting the interconnectedness in the system. Systemic change often requires systemic solutions. But putting our map here, we want it to be a constant reminder that the telescope should be taken off, because oftentimes, the optimal solution may not lie in any specific point we're looking at. As for our insights and lessons learned, our team believe that we're not just doing a project in research for the competition, and we're actually making impact on people and community that we really care about. And we see ourselves in the system, that's where we're gonna start to take our actions. Next semester, we're gonna collaborate with Vanderbilt University Hospital and possibly other social enterprises and organizations globally to continue our work. We believe that all children have an equal right to education. Thanks for your time and listening. Thank you. Judges are just uh, getting their sheets. <laughs> Thank you so much. Kick it off when you're ready. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know you mentioned that uh, when you showed us all the, fu as fun the funding gaps as a key part of the, the root causes and that you chose to kind of adjust the solutions from that. But I'd be curious about what, what do you think the mental models are behind that, the funding gaps there and what are the mental models behind the way the money is currently distributed? Um, because they're, you know, just seeing how that currently is moving along and making sure that what is the next step down, even if it's not something you can address right now, if you could speak to those perspectives. Yeah, actually in the mental model, we more focused on, as you can see in the paper, the cultural values. For example, the misunderstanding of the complications of chronic diseases, or like um, the normality mental model about what should be the normal pathway for those children. But we do mention like the me mechanism behind the money in the system structures. One of them is, uh, profit-driven business model of the hospital. As we understand, hospitals are actually corporate entities. And in the Nashville, the hospital work by insurances, like there are free insurances, insurances provided to people. However, those insurances doesn't cover the patient-centered care. They only care the medical treatments. So what that means is that the child life specialist, home uh, hospital school teachers, 
and volunteers, they are not paid by the insurances. So the hospital will consider them as cost-driven instead of profit-driven. However, just as we mentioned, child life specialists can save millions of money and millions of lives by calming the children without using the anesthesia. So those social values are invisible behind policymakers' eyes. That's why we want to bypass the money to prove those social values and therefore ask for, ask for more money. Yeah. yeah, and to follow up on that, uh, it's a cultural value or societal value that we, um, we value achievement more than happiness. So for children with chronic diseases, they are temporarily disabled. And for them, our society sees them as uh, vulnerable, fragile, um, we pity them, but we don't see their strength. We don't see their self-efficacy. So this is why uh, investors don't choose to invest their money into the system, and it's, it's um, lower on the priority list. And that's why, that's yes. it, another. Yeah. And just to in, uh, adding on that, um, speaking of how these children actually have the capacity of doing a lot of things, and they're just not being provided with the tools, we have something like, for instance, I'll give you guys an example. So, um, I, can you throw an apple at me? What? No, throw an apple at me. Throw an apple. No. Wait, what? No, wait. How come, why, why can't you do that? You can't, you can't even throw an apple at me? Like, why can't you do that? I don't even have an apple. Well, what yeah, you? that's the thing. It's the same for children with chronic diseases. It's not because they cannot throw. It's because they don't have the apple. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to provide them with the resources, services, and tools they need. And it's because we, we don't want to say they're incapable of anything. So we hope to provide them the supports, and then they could use that support to succeed. Thank you for asking. Thanks very much, and I just wanted to commend you for not having um, the time sort of prompts in front of you and also dealing with a little bit of uh, us delaying before you started. Um, I wanted to ask if any of your research focused on or looked at the relationship between families, so not just the chronically ill child, but their support network, so their parents, siblings, if they have them, and what that looked like in your research. Yeah, so for families, we actually had, uh, we only interviewed one parent, but through uh, our talks, we found that f social workers are highly overworked. So they are the initial source for families to get information about what's their next step. Because when the, the child gets diagnosed with chronic diseases, the families are in panic. And at the same time, there are so many other social stressors put on them. For example, their financial stress, they had to find maybe a nearby job, maybe they have to uh, move to uh, a place next to the hospital. And at this time, because the social workers are, over, are overworked, they can't get the information to the family on time. And the, the, here is a delay in um, bridging the information gap. And Yeah, there's also actually a positive outlier mm -hmm. for family. Just in the um, pro non-profit organization we mentioned, Ronald McDonald House, they offer free accommodation to poor outpatient families. And that includes every family member. What I mean by that is parents and siblings. They can together have their own individual room, and they will also share a communal room with other families. They will cook together. They will keep their vibe when their children have to see the hospital that is far away from their home. So yeah, that is. Yeah. yeah. And also to, uh, and also we want to talk back to the communication system. There's a part, there's students and family sectors in the yellow box above it. So that's the part that why we want to provide more assurance and support to them. Because people always think, oh, you're a parent a pa or, or parents of children with chronic diseases, and that's probably going to be like one of the most important stressors in your life. However, for these parents and a lot of families, they have much more stressors than, stressors than that, including their job or their personal relationships. And adding those together, we want to release their stressors in our field by providing this communication model. Um, just a quick question. Thank you for that. Um, one of the things that I heard you say is, isn't funding the fundamental root cause? Could you just explain what you're thinking when you said that? Just elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, so, um, isn't funding the root cause? Because when we were interviewing our um, interlocutors, 
it's always mentioned up. For example, uh, when we talked to a hospital school teacher, she mentioned to us, um, our program is uh, having progress, but it's very slow because we don't have the money. Like the hospital doesn't really support, uh, support us. They don't see us as a main part of their work. And then besides that, I think we gave a, a example of the nurse practitioner. For ev uh, evidence-based research, it's actually very beneficial for proving the social revenues that we, that we mentioned. And then they didn't get enough funding for, for the research to run. And, yeah. and also, like we talked to child life specialists, they have like one to 50 ratio. They cannot talk to every children, like come every children before MRI. We also talked to the hospital school teacher. There are only three hospital school teachers for 197 children in the Vanderbilt Hospital Medical Center. And those three, children, those three teachers had to serve 200 children with different grades, with different area specializations. Three teachers cannot teach everything, but they have to teach everything. However, we try to, in our solutions, to make deep connections and try to maneuver existing resources. So we suggest the inter-hospital collaboration model. What I mean by that is there's not only one hospital in Nashville, and different hospitals have different number of hospital school teachers who can teach different grades and different areas. And by creating, co-creating classrooms, either online or offline, we can enlarge our resources and serve more children to their individual needs. Yeah, so the point that we want to make here is uh, money is not omnipotent, but without money, we can do nothing. Because if we have funding and with good uh, system operation and also with all the supervisions and parties cooperating together, the money can be very useful, can be used to hire members, uh, uh, like for volunteer training, and at the same time, I think uh, it can be given to the uh, general school principal, and they can distribute the money to where it really needs help. I just want to pick up on that. The, the language of root cause is deeply woven into this competition and a lot of the curriculum. And I th I th there's something quite problematic about it to me in systems terms because it implies you've somehow got to the bottom and now you found the answer, <laughs> like we just deal with this. It seemed to me I heard you using that in the way you'd structured your analysis, but then when I heard you talk about funding, I loved the fact that you brought in these three questions because so many of the submissions, it seems like there's always two, two solutions. We just need more money from someone and people need to talk to each other more and you've addressed both of those, which I really appreciated. So I guess my question is, if you were to go back to your analysis again, and let's just say whatever you're gonna call it, root cause, call it whatever you want, you're gonna take a different lens on the problem. What might that lens be, and would you, do you think you would arrive at a similar model? Well, first of all, I think the reason why we think money is the root cause is because this population is really underpaid attention. In America, we have a special education system for children with autism, for children with ADHD, but for children with chronic diseases, they are only considered temporarily disabled. So oftentimes, they cannot receive the help such as IEP and 504. And the most obvious manifestation of their underpaid attention is that they don't get enough funding. We can see how much funding IEP have, and we can see how much funding the hospital school program have, how much funding the homebound department have, and that's what we think can be root cause is because the difference is so large. Yes, and uh, if we're going to take a different lens at the issues, I guess this, this time we're talking about the funding, so it's kind of like bottom up, uh, no, it's like top down, like from the funding to every sectors. But maybe another lens could be bottom up, so from the advocacy and the voices of the children that the problem rooted in. So that's another lens that we could look at the issues. Can I sneak in with a quick question? I'm curious about this tension that came up in our group yesterday between the medical and the social model. And the reason the medical model is clearly um, so dominant is because it's easy to quantify. Um, you're proposing, and I, I really appreciate how you've approached the funding issue, and I, and I, I appreciate the asset-based thinking behind this. But how are you going to address that tension where you go to speak to hospitals and, they, and it's hard to measure a social response. It's hard to attribute that financial value to something as complex as a social response? It's a big question, so just a sh very short answer. 
Oh um, yes. <laughs> so we're actually collaborating. Oh uh, no, we're actually we actually interviewed with one of our professor, Professor Bowes, and she is doing the social revenue research, and she is trying to find better models to kind of measure the social revenue, as you said, is really complex. And our team is also helping with another researcher focusing in, uh, on the and social work called Monkey in My Chair to kind of evaluate the social revenue generated there. And I feel like there's, we don't already have an answer for the question, but working, we're working towards that. Thank you for the yeah. question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vanderbilt. <laughs> Delayed reaction, thank you. I'm glad somebody got it. Okay, um, Wesleyan is on their way. Um, we are going to continue talking about challenges facing our children, but in a very different context. Uh, now the Wesleyan team is looking at the issue of child marriage. Uh, it's coming. So you have three microphones here. Hello, hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yeah, sorry we don't have those two. <laughs> This is Dewi. She was 15 when she was sexually assaulted, and within months later, as a result of her pregnancy and disapproval of her parents, she got married off. When we talked to Dewi, she described her experience as being in one tiny box without windows. But Dewi is not alone. One in seven Indonesian girls got married before the age of 18, which means there's a total of 1.8 million child brides in Indonesia making it the eighth highest in the world. No longer a daughter, what made Dewi a child bride? This is a central question we seek to answer in our presentation. There are root causes and perpetuating factors that makes girls more, child, more vulnerable to child marriage. The root causes include economic disempowerment and patriarchal sociocultural norms, while perpetuating factors include legislative loopholes and government inefficiencies. The first root cause is economic disempowerment. It has been found that child marriage rates for girls from poor households can double that of their wealthy peers. This is particularly evident in times of natural disasters and economic shocks, when more daughters are wedded off to alleviate economic losses, resulting in the child marriage rates tripling. There are two main loops that poverty fits into. The first loop is poverty education loop a vicious cycle between poverty, low educational attainment, and child marriage. Poverty forces a child to marry, and once married, to drop out of school to serve household duties. An average of six fewer years in school deprives the child brides of em employable skill sets and many other opportunities, rendering them economically dependent on their husbands after marriage. The children of the child brides are also typically born into poverty and have limited educational attainment, thus reinforcing this intergenerational vicious cycle. The second loop is poverty environment loop, a vicious cycle between poverty, environmental degradation, and child marriage. Poverty forces people to work in environmentally destructive industries namely illegal logging and slash and burn agriculture. This results in inefficient use of natural resources and agricultural vulnerability to natural disasters, which are both cited as causes of regional poverty, inequality, and hindrances to island development. 
Apart from economic disempowerment, the second root cause we found is patriarchal sociocultural norms. This manifests itself on a few different levels. Firstly, marriage is just so simply emphasized in Indonesian society. Certain interpretations of the Islamic theology not only justifies child marriage, but also enshrines marriage as the necessary step of life. But moreover, on a broader scale, the general Indonesian culture also treats marriage as an essential part of society. At the same time, women in Indonesia often face commodification and objectification. Dollars are often seen as assets to be traded for dowry. Women's value solely lies in their caregiving and childbearing duties after marriage. And there's an insistence on and sexual purity, rendering premarital sex a taboo. But why do these norms persist? We found the answer still in economic disempowerment. Living in under-resourced areas, low-income parents often have limited access to information on gender equality through the media or the internet or education about sex, same sex in school meaning that when their children become parents, they're likely to pass on the same set of patriarchal values they were indoctrinated with. With limited awareness of women's rights, instances of sexual violence have become very prevalent in Indonesian society. And because of the absence of sex education, teenagers do not know about safe sex measures or dealing with sexual assault. And because the culture stigmatizes sex, there's limited access to abortion and contraceptives leading to an increase in unwanted pregnancies and sexually transmittable diseases, both of which are clear evidence of premarital sex that forces young girls to marry. Apart from the root causes, there are also perpetuating factors that further reinforce this status quo system. The first perpetuating factor is legislative loophole. In 2019, Indonesia raised the minimum marriage age for girls from 16 to 19, which can be considered progress, but the vicious cycle with socio-patriarchal norms will show us why this may not work. Firstly, as daughters are still seen as parents' property, parents have legal right to appeal to marry their daughters off despite being underage. Secondly, as marriage is still seen as a cultural necessity, it is a prerequisite for some social welfare programs, thus incentivizing parents to marry their daughter off to alleviate poverty in terms of economic shocks. And finally, as, social, as in, social, sorry, in Indonesian society, women's sexual purity and reproductive values are highly emphasized. The premarital sex is banned and abortion is highly restricted. Does living child marriage as the only way out of sexual assault? The second perpetuating factor is inefficiencies in implementation. So large-scale policies are not feasible due to the decentralized governance system in Indonesia. They are also not effective due to corruption and interdepartmental rivalry. Stakeholders also lack, lack the incentive and grassroots corporations. To understand our problem further, we also have created a systems map, an iceberg model, and a stakeholders map, which can be further analyzed to our power and interest map. So the further the actor is to the right, the more interest they have in changing the problems at hand. The higher the, act, the, higher the actor is on the power axis, the bigger their influence is in changing the issue of child marriage in Indonesia. We also have analyzed the solutions that exist in our status quo through our solutions landscape, which we divide into three categories. So solutions by national government, grassroots NGOs, and international organizations. So sure. we found this to be insufficient. Based on the challenges we've discussed, we've identified gaps and levers of change to further reduce girls' vulnerability to child marriage. Firstly, to address economic disempowerment, we recommend tying economic policies directly to the goal of ending child marriage. This means providing conditional economic incentives that is based on agreement that girls will stay in school and not be married off. But this is merely a short-term solution. To have truly long-term sustainable change, there needs to be a recognition that women are particularly disempowered in the Indonesian economy, meaning that there needs to be a series of women-centered education and training programs to empower them. But to do this, we need to first combat the patriarchal norms. Currently, the government campaigns often rely on signboards and posters, which we found to be too traditional and having too limited outreach, which is why we recommend utilizing the social media and the internet to raise awareness. 
At the same time, education against child marriage in school often exists in silos, which is why we suggest a comprehensive set of sex education curriculum to be in implemented so that child marriage is talked about in conversation with other issues of gender equality and safe sex. But all of these educational measures can be seen as top-down and condescending, which is why we suggest a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program where former child brides, child marriage survivors, can act as mentors, role models, and counselors that offer first-hand experiences, relatable advice to those who are younger and still struggling. To address loopholes in legislation, we think that the recent amendments in law does not address systemic problems. To have truly holistic progress, we need to increase the number of female lawmakers in the Indonesian parliament. At the same time, such legislation is often weakened by weak judiciary enforcement, which is why there needs to be an establishment of an independent board that checks and balances the judicial power. Lastly, to address inefficiencies in governmental implementation, we think that there's currently no recognition of the importance of grassroots voices, which is why the government should fund and support the community-based child protection mechanisms. Through all of our recommendations, we hope to not only assist the governmental and NGO actors, but to also consolidate their expertise, ability, and resources. But more importantly, we hope to call on those who have been missing from the conversation, the community leaders, the parents, the teachers, and teens themselves, valuing their voices and bringing them to the same table where decisions are made. Because after all, we are not system thinkers. They are. The community members we talk to, Dewi, and many Indonesian girls, young, young and old, they don't need saviors. In fact, they've taught us so much throughout this process that we are just merely active listeners and a bridge that helps to bring their inspiring story into the conversation and to you. So then they're no longer seen as someone's brides, no longer someone's daughters, not a victim, but just themselves, just humans. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for that. Uh, that was great. Um, I really liked your information design, so lots, lots for other teams as well to learn from you, so well done. Um, one question, so you use the word implementation a lot. Uh, what do you mean by that exactly, and who's doing the implementing? And again, are you basically saying that we know what needs to happen, but we're not able to do it? So I was just wondering what you mean by that, and if you can just elaborate a little bit what you mean by implementation. Thank you for the question. Okay, so, uh, sorry, let me uh, repeat. If, I'm not sure if I understand the question right. So it's uh, what about the implementation of policies against child marriage? What right. I mean is, um, are you saying that we know what needs to happen? Like we know the things, like there's, you know, there's five solutions and we just have to implement them. So we know what to do, but we don't know how to do it. So I'm just wondering when you say um, there's a lack of implementation, what is it you mean basically? In our uh, the perpetuating factor in we mentioned government inefficiencies, right? That means I think we we knows what needs to be done in terms of uh, how to reduce child marriage. But that depends on who you are talking to, basically. If you ask researcher, you get one question. But if you ask the people from the governments or NGOs, you get another. But basically, we think like there is the barriers to implementation that preventing what should be done from really happening. For, for example, like uh, you you know that uh, if you in the if everyone knows that uh, education like of educational attainment is a problem. But one problem in this specific case is that the government will see the education as more, in, more as the problem, not the child marriage, or the poverty as a problem, not child marriage. So the policies will be oriented toward the, this kind of problems not addressing child marriage themselves. And that re result in uh, the lack of implementation of the policy that target child marriage themselves. For example, we have pol Indonesia since 2007 at least has uh, the cash transfer programs that target at alleviating poverty. But it, it proved ineffective or not enough at least because it target poverty, not the women themselves. So the, when the measure of the success of each program is different, the results are different, and that's, that's what we mean by uh, the lack of implementation of child marriage policies. 
Just one little comment, and then uh, I'll hand over. So, um, from what I've understood, and, and um, the problem is that you need to change culture, that there's a culture where it's acceptable uh, to have child marriages. And um, I think the question is, uh, and you don't have to answer this question, but my, my thought is that you know, you can legislate those changes and people still don't do it because it's culture, right? So again, it's not a question you have to answer, but I think that the challenge is that, um, you know, how does that culture shift? And, and I think your peer-to-peer -peer model um, sounds like a very promising idea because obviously it's very different from the government saying you can't do that um, than hearing, as you said, the voices of um, people who have been in this situation. So anyway, that was just the thought that actually um, it's a shift of culture which cannot be legislated from the top, basically. But just passing it on. Um, thanks. Thank you for your presentation. I li really love the idea of having more women in, in politics to help with this representation. It's really important. Related to that is the religious thing and related to that question. Have you come across in your research in any other country where a cultural religious um, issue is, is, has been solved by working with religious leaders to overturn people's perceptions and what, what should be right versus what's currently happening? Is there anywhere in your research where you've seen religion really turn things around? So um, I can add in a little bit about my personal experience first. So I'm from Singapore, another Southeast Asian nation that is quite conservative and very religious. And um, so there is currently a lot of talk around um, LGBTQ rights and um, gender equality, which religion is often seen as an adversary towards. But um, so um, as a trans person myself, the, the, the kind of um, uh, strategies that uh, the organizations I'm working with are really just to um, talk to religious leaders and like relook at the biblical, the the more th the sacred text, and to see um, the potential, the promiscuous, the, the 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 possible the possibility of us existing. Because through our research, we realize that um, homophobia and transphobia are not inherently our cultural and religious value. They are often imported by the colonizers, and so we we manage to talk to religious leaders who purport, uh, who then talk about the the inherent kindness and the acceptance and tolerance in their religion. And currently, there's a lot of organizations in Singapore that at least on the issue of gender and queer rights, they are like they're a very foundational and crucial um, part of the movement. Um, to add into that, I think through our research, we did try to find um, whether in other countries if they work with religious leaders, if there's you know significant changes. But I think that was one of the hurdles that we come into, just because it's a really hard metric to sort of like quantify of whether if we if we work with one religious leader, leader whether like this part of town suddenly become just very accepting of child marriage. So that's sort of something that's more qualitative and quantitative side. It's really hard to quantify. But I think um, there has been a lot more sort of like progress in terms of Indonesian society. What I can give example of is just in terms of gender equality. I think within our religion, there's a lot of like women should not be working and stuff like that. But I think throughout the years, there's more sort of emphasis that, you know, women taking care of their family, their working is part of taking care of their family. And letting them to do, to chase their dreams and doing whatever they want. So there's definitely been an improvement and in progress, but I think as we said, like if we target it specific towards child marriage and have that message come across as something that's more specific, we think that that can come, um, has a big progress in terms of solving this issue. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just add very little. Actually, there's the, a promising or like a hopeful example in Indonesia where religion organization work to prevent child marriage or reduce child marriage. Actually, even uh, in, in Indonesia in the past, there are like the group called Muslim Feminists, I will get back to you later about the specific name of the organizations, that work on interpreting the religious text in certain way to reduce child marriage or prevent it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I just wanted to appreciate how you have brought your personal stories into the room and wanted to honor how you've mentioned that and allowed us to listen to that. Um, my question is about uh, you spoke a bit about the environmental degradation and um, natural disasters, and if you could speak to how that the movements in that system are influencing or affecting um, what you've studied and, and yeah, what we can learn from that as well. Mm. Sorry, so the question is what we can learn from the environmental poverty loop? Or 
Yeah, well, not from the loop, but just because it, it came up in a number of your maps, and I'd love to hear more about how that influences what you've learned about this system, and perhaps are there other ways we can address what's going on in this system through what you've learned about the environment? Yes, uh, can we go back to that slide? Yeah, okay, uh, in the meantime. Uh, actually, I think that's the whole full loop, that, not whole full, I mean like the loop that we can be optimistic about, uh, we, that we can solve, because uh, one thing about that is what, I, what we say in this loop is that when people don't have edu don't uh, have low educational attainment, they have to work in their traditional like slash and burn agriculture or illegal logging, and so that further destroy, destroy the environment, right? But actually, if we, I believe that if if they have higher education and can access to the like service sector or in knowledge economy, which the jobs are more sustainable, for example, like research or innovation. Is like if there are also other countries like Saudi Arabia that have the quest toward knowledge economy that going to have people educate more people to make them to enable them to depend less on environment and this is supported by a group of research about environmental goodness curve in Indonesia that there is a study that find the correlation that in the long term if we can increase the income in rural areas. Uh, there will be less deforestation in the long run. I was curious to hear a little bit more, um, given the recent legislature win of moving from age 16 to 19, were there any insights that came through in your stakeholder interviews, things that could help inform how you might prioritize building more of a movement and a culture shift of this overall system? Yes, of course. So one of the interviews we talked about was actually a leader of an NGO that fight for this legislation change in the first place. And one of the questions we asked was that even with the, you know, that parents can overturn in a sense the law, that do you think that this is a good change forward? And I think one of the things that she mentioned was that it is a really big change forward considering Indonesia, you know, um, you, at, at the mere age of 16, you can marry, but now, you know, it makes it harder for people to, so there's some sort of a barrier uh, in terms of marrying your child early. It's not perfect, but it is a one step forward in terms of legislation. I think it offers a lot of hope for people. I think secondly, um, it also, in a way, shines a light on the other problems that we have in Indonesia. That is in terms of how big religion play. So when you get married, you usually have to go to a religious court. And usually people really see that if you get married under the law of religion, that that is a very, you know, like, that is like, you know, you get married, uh, but not really under the edge of the law. So I think how much religion plays into that, I think if we have a minimum for the next legislation, and uh, I think taking that into account is something that's very important. But, but also, second of all, um, I think a lot of the people that we talked to, you know, they didn't really necessarily want to marry early. A lot of them have talked about, like, if they can continue their education, they would. But it's really under just certain circumstances. So while legislation, banning people not to marry early is important, but also I think taking a look at a lot of the times it's really because of the situation that they're in. So their economic disprivilege and also with the environmental situation, that those are the things that we need to do in conjunction with having legislation changes. And that's how you're gonna you know, be able to change child marriage in Indonesia. So it's really not like just legislation, although that's important, but we need to do you know, various things in conjunction to do that. All right, thank you so much, Wesleyan. Anyone need to stand up and have a stretch? Let's all stand up. If you want to stretch, you can stretch with me. Arms up. Reach for the ceiling. Bend to one side. Bend to another side. Reach for the ceiling again. And then bring your arms down to the sides. If you want to get yogic, we can do that. And now just move around as you wish. Come on up. How are you?
All right, party people, let's take our seats. Hey, all good? Yeah. Last but not least, the smallest team. <laughs> exactly, that's what I mean. Every year we have some map the system teams who consist of one person, and uh, it's always uh, it's always really interesting. It's a bigger challenge in some ways, and. Uh, uh, and then maybe in other ways, you don't have to agree with anybody. Um, anyways, we're really excited about this uh, sixth and final presentation. Um, and assuming your mic is uh, working as soon as he gets Is it up working? There, there yeah, it is. You can hear me? Um, so let's welcome Athabasca University. Thank you. I've had students tell me that they don't know how they're going to make the exam because they don't have childcare. And I've had students tell me that they had to put food back at the grocery store because they can't afford that anymore. And I've had students tell me that they have to drop out. I want a post-secondary system where every single student has all of the resources they need to succeed. That means academic support, but it also means a safe place to live and enough food. My name is Karen Fletcher, and I recently completed my term as the president of the Athabasca University Student Union. Through that role, I had the absolute privilege of hearing my fellow students' stories. We did surveys annually where we got about 1,000 responses about what students were dealing with and what their major issues were. We had town halls and a variety of other options for students to come and make their voices heard. Now, if you ask the government or a university in Canada, what does the university system in Canada look like, you'll get something that looks like this. The university and its parts are in blue. There's the province up at the top in orange. It funds and regulates the system, as well as contributes to financial aid along with the federal and indigenous governments. There's also other actors, you know, students, industry, scattered among the edge. We can see this is highly segmented, it's hierarchical, and it centers the university. But if you speak to students and you map their experiences and what they go through, you get something that looks like this. Now there's a lot going on here. You'll notice there are different categories. We have financial issues, we have more academic issues like pedagogy, we have trying to figure out how to navigate the space with the hidden curriculum. And what was really interesting from this map was seeing how the academic parts, the grades, the do they attend class connects to the non-academic parts, the do they have enough to eat or do they have childcare. So at this point I did stop and ask if I was overcomplicated things because I do that. Um, but as I reflected, I came to the conclusion that the complexity really reveals the great truth of the system, which is that students are failed at the borders between those different colored silos. For example, Accessibility services needs to okay accommodations or adjustments. That means that if a student has a learning disability, they need an official diagnosis. Financial aid over here theoretically does fund that under certain conditions, um, but a lot of things have to line up with when your school starts. If you look at just financial aid, it looks okay. If you look at just accessibility services, it looks okay. They do not work well together. And as students straddle those two systems, they end up being failed by the system. Similarly, this student has exam anxiety. They're worried that they don't have babysitting, but that that's gonna snowball into failing the class because you have to write the exam to pass, and then dropping out of school, and then be not having financial aid, and then you're homeless, and then what do you do? This is the sort of thing that students worry about. But what the system often sees is, oh, that student doesn't show up for their exam. They really must not care. So who can help, and what does help look like? This is who's in the system. What's really important here is that there are some people with lots of power that aren't immediately impacted by their decisions, like the provincial government. 
There are others, like students, who are deeply impacted by decisions others make, but don't have a lot of agency to change the system on their own. This highlights the importance of consultation and co-design, and that's a lever of change we can look to as we try to make sure that the decision makers are making decisions that actually work with those with lived experience. Solutions have to work across clusters. They have to be simpler to use than dealing with the problem itself, and they have to be anchored to our values and not our conventions. We've always done it that way is not a good reason to continue to hurt people. So I'm practical, I like solutions. So I have five levers and how we can use them for you. I've spoken about the barriers to getting adjustments or accommodations. First of all, that's a, a systems issue. We're looking at the medical model of disability where we say you're only disabled if a doctor says you are and you can fill out this 10 page report. Simply believing people when they say they need certain things to succeed would be a huge change. Within the system though, there are people that benefit from those diagnoses and there's funding in the financial aid system. It's just really hard to access. If we took that same funding that's already there and just reallocated it and said, universities, you are required to use it to fund in-house psychologists, it would dramatically reduce the difficulty in using the resources already present. Next, we have barriers accessing opportunities. This is a foreign space to many people. If your family has never come to university, it, you don't necessarily know that, hey, going to office hours is gonna help you build a relationship with your prof and that's gonna help you get jobs down the line. There's a fantastic nonprofit out of Scotland called My Academic Family that addresses this by teaching the unwritten rules. They have mentorship programs as well as how to university seminars. And they explain things like, what do you wear at university? And it's just a safe space to ask all the questions that maybe feel, feel stupid, but, but help you if you know the answer. And those sorts of programs would really benefit Canadian students as well. Next, we have some issues with financial aid. In Canada, financial aid is supposed to be needs-based, which sounds really fair, right? You have more need, you get more money. Except how much need you get, how much need you're assessed as having, is dependent on what your family looks like. I have three children, and I raise them with my husband. And so my government looks at me and goes, she has three dependents. Check, more need for her. If I had a friend who was helping his mother raise his three siblings, the government goes, they're not dependents, even if the financial contribution he's making is the same as me. There are lots of people who get left out of financial aid, which means they can't afford university, because their families look different, and that's wrong. However, it's a very small part of a system that's widely used. If we had a good, hard look at what does family look like, what does obligation look like, and make sure we include everyone or as many as possible, that would allow people who are currently excluded by the system to access the financial aid they need to stay in school. Next, things can snowball. We saw with the student earlier who was worried about her exam and not having child care. One thing turned into a much bigger thing, right? Child care becomes failing, becomes losing, financial aid means eviction. We want to intervene early. There is a university in Australia that has a central system for when students request extra help or extensions. And if they do it a certain number of times, someone shows up and goes, hey, what's going on? Is the problem that you need academic help that you don't understand something? Or is the problem that you need to talk to the mental health resource person? Or the housing resource person? And it addresses the thing that's actually causing the problem so the student can go back to focusing on education. And I love that because it, it meets the student where they're at and it sees the student as a whole person, not just this little window of their life that is academia. And finally, we need some flexibility. I go to an online university and when the provost asked me why I picked AU, I said it was the only university I could go to. With three little kids, I couldn't afford uh, tuition and daycare at the same time, it was impossible. Um, AU met me where I was at. There are people who are disabled in a way that makes it difficult to commute, but they can absolutely learn. And there are so many different people that benefit from this flexible model. And I would like all institutions to have flexible options, 
either within themselves or really well-defined pathways. If someone's like, hey, this semester, my life is a disaster, but I still want to learn. And they can go and they can have the flexible option when they need it, and then they can come back to their home institution when they're able to engage in that way. Again, so it keeps them on the road to graduation. So where does this get us? It makes it better. It doesn't fix everything. But I'm a big next steps, not end goals person. Sometimes we need to get moving. And all of these things will help more students stay in school and get across that stage. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, when I was reading the report, uh, it, you didn't go into this so much in the presentation. Um, you were the premise of the report seemed to be largely about exposing the mental models that underline the reality. So I loved the way you presented this here. Of here's the formal structure that people think of as a university. Here's the reality that particularly underprivileged people maybe um, experience. Um, I was wondering, in the analysis, were there any of your own mental models that you found being challenged when you went into the system as it actually is? I learned a lot about how colonialism impacted um, certain fellow students' experiences. I'd say it, it was something that was very much a blind spot. Um, earlier, just the degree to which that impacts all the different parts. Um, of someone's life from how we assess financial aid to how we assess academic merit. Um, and that was something that I didn't realize how extensive it was. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, did you look in your research at students who are at risk of leaving but actually can't leave for cultural reasons? So. It could be family members who are like, you, can't, you have to stay in education. So you're like, they're kind of stuck in between two worlds that they don't want to be in. And how do you, if you came across it, how do you deal with it? No, I didn't actually look at, at that because most of the students at the university I go to don't necessarily have that huge support system behind them. They are the support system. And the average age of students at AU is 27 when they start. Um, and so we don't have the students who are 19 who have to get a degree because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, they go to other institutions, and so that wasn't the type of student um, I was looking at. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, okay, it's a lot enough. Um, thank you very much, and commend you for doing it on your own. Um, big, big job. Um, I wanted to just ask, I really loved what you said about flexibility, about meeting people where they are, um, and about sort of understanding on a needs-based assessment person by person. Do you think we need some form of baseline, and do you have any idea what metrics would be better to use uh, to measure that baseline, or should we throw any baseline out the window? I think it depends on what, on what uh, program we're talking about. I want my nurse to know how to put in an IV well, right? Like, that, that, that's a competency we need to have. Um, I think in communications, perhaps, there could be a wider variety of ways someone could demonstrate competence. Um, I'm a math student, so we have exams. We have very like clear, you need to be able to integrate such and such. Um, and I think there are places for saying, no, everyone needs to be able to do this. But I think assessing how they do that whether they're expressing that verbally or in a presentation or an exam. I think as long as they can meet learning outcomes, uh, I'm happy. I, I think we do have to have learning outcomes because otherwise everything gets a little bit wishy-washy, especially um, f for credentials that, that are, are tied to things people do specifically, like nursing and nursing. Hi. Um, is it possible to back up to one of your slides, the power slide that you had? Uh, yeah. So um, 
One question and kind of a comment before that. So the, over the last, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years, there's been a shift in how we understand power. Um, mm -hmm. So we used to understand power as something you had, like a bar of gold or a brick. Um, and, and the understanding of power now is that it's a relationship, basically. So the question, um, and it's a type of relationship. So, you know, you talked about colonialism. You've talked about some of these dynamics that are essentially our uh, power dynamics between different actors. So I guess the question I have is, you know, you think about people like the provincial government or federal government. I mean, it's basically people, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, so one of the questions is, you know, what, what, how do we change the relationship or what should the relationship be between different actors in the system that are perceived, if you like, as having low power? Because, again, it's a form of relationship that yeah. we have. So how do we shift those or what relationships would you shift and how would you shift them? Okay, so if you see student groups, mm -hmm. um, in Canada, most universities have student unions and those student unions work together. So I regularly met with the others um, in my province. The organization was called CAUSE, as well as the ones across Canada, that was called CASA. And those groups would work together um, as registered lobbying groups and, and, um, and form relationships with whoever was in government and have regular check-ins and, and regular communication. And it was really cool when COVID happened. Um, CASA, our national lobbying group, put out a report and said, this is what students need. And the government was like, great, thank you. We'll do more or less that. Right. And that was cool because of that ongoing relationship. So I think that's a really good example of how there is an effective relationship mm -hmm. um, where the student concerns have an effective conduit to decision makers. Yeah, I guess, I guess what I mean is just, uh, and I'm conscious of time, just a quick mm -hmm. example. So uh, I worked in Canada. Um, worked on First Nations issues, and I had this experience of bringing uh, somebody from the federal government who was responsible for yeah. Aboriginal affairs into a First Nations community, and we couldn't kind of get them out. Like three hours later, we were trying to pull them out, and afterwards I said, you know, what, what's kind of, what was happening there? And she basically said to me, I've never had a conversation with someone from a First Nations community other than across a negotiating table. Yep. So what I mean is there is, in many cases, and I've seen that in other federal government agencies in Canada where there is actually no relation, like literally I have never spoken to somebody as a yeah. government official. So that's kind of what I mean, that obviously there's lobbying and shifting government, but also it's a bit like, how do they get to understand the lived experiences of the people that you're talking about? Because I'm guessing they don't. Yeah, well, that, I, I would say that's quite accurate at the federal and provincial level. From the institution level at AU, we would be able to have town halls where we pulled mm -hmm. some of the administrators in and we also had student representation on a significant number of committees, and they heard what, what we had to say, because uh, I'm often the loudest person in the room. Um, but that was one way that we were able to bring Great. information just on a rolling basis, and we'd have regular stakeholder meetings. So every quarter, we'd meet with each of the deans for just to sit down, and it wasn't a, I want something. I mean, sometimes it was, but mm -hmm. it was, hey, what's, what's new with you? Let's talk to you about what students are concerned about. Great, thank you. So I think I'm asking the same question in a different way. You had a really interesting slide, or you opened up with a statement that you, you are operating in a system where students have all the resources that they need. And I think that's quite a phenomenal acknowledgement um, and a reframing. So I want to acknowledge that. I really think that's important. But I do think it creates a problem for you in that I would imagine a lot of the responses you're getting from your different stakeholders are, well, students have all the resources they need. So how do you advocate and lobby and make sure that you influence to recognize that we're not going for minimum standard here, we're going for complexity and detail? I think storytelling is part of that. I think one of the ways that we've tried to do it recently with some of the conversations I've had is to point out to administrators that they were the sort of person that maybe did have all the resources they need. Like most people who end up being an MP or a university president had family stand behind them, had resources, and, and to be able to be like, let me talk to you about how that helped you, and let me introduce you to this person's story. And it's been interesting to, to kind of see the wheels turn and, and to have some conversations where people were like, oh yeah, I guess if I didn't know how to function in a university system, it would be harder. And I, I think it comes back to relationships. When, when you see the person that you're trying to help or that, that is in power as another human being with a full life, 
it's easier to be like, let's, let's bridge, build a bridge between us. And, and a lot of that is, is getting to know each other as real people instead of as the person sitting across a table. I just love to pick up on the unwritten rules yeah. aspect. That was a theme here in um, opening up access. And um, curious if you could share more. Is it about making the unwritten rules available or shifting those rules so that that step isn't necessary at all? I think anywhere is going to have a way of doing things. Like culture is what we, how we do things here, right? Wherever here is. Um, and I, I think that's okay as long as we're upfront about what we expect. It's a problem when we assume someone is incompetent if they didn't do something when we didn't tell them we ever wanted to do that. Um, and universities are a learning space and, and having just explicit teaching is okay. Um, yeah. I had another thought, but it has gone rogue. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a thing. It's going to be a thing. Um, wow. Can we just give all six teams another round of applause? Okay. So that concludes part two of the program. I'm going to ask everyone to stay seated for a moment. We're going to do a group photo outdoors in the amphitheater, and there'll be a break. Uh, but I first want to um, allow our judges to make a quick escape so they can begin their deliberation. So judges, if you want to collect your things, um, and uh, as you head out towards the back of the amphitheater, you'll see your friend, Alan Groom, um, just standing up at the top of the stairs, and he will uh, take you to your secret deliberation chamber, or chamber of secrets, as it's sometimes known. Um, we'll, ha we'll have you join for the photo, but uh, go ahead and get started. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I do that, it's like the laugh is more and more evil sounding. I have to be careful. Okay, so here is the program. Um, we will, for those who are in person, we are all going to be going out to the amphitheater. Um, plenty of Skoll Center staff and some of our locals will help guide us on the way. Um, we're going to gather up for a photo, and then we will have a break, so you can just get some fresh air, uh, mingle and network and such. And we'll be back here for 3.30, for those online, 3.30 UK time, um, to start again uh, welcoming our guest speakers, and that'll be followed by the awards ceremony. So let's all move together, if we can, to the photo. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Hello. All right, can I get a <laughs> on three? One, two, three. <laughs> Excellent. So I've just emerged from the Chamber of Secrets, and it is intense. It is intense in there. This is a really good problem to have, uh, but there's uh, vigorous, vigorous discussion happening. Um, so thank you for provoking that. Um, so before we get to the awards, um, we're really honored to be able to, um, to, to close out are um, convening today with, uh, with a really uh, a couple of important friends and partners um, speaking to us. And uh, first off, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, George Constantinescu, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Transformation Officer of ATCO um, and Canada Utilities Limited. In this role, um, George is responsible for leading transformation initiatives that enable innovation and growth across the enterprise and advancing new commercial initiatives around the world. And it's a great example of what Mariah was saying before that this kind of systemic systems-led innovation is not simply the domain of the the social entrepreneurship or the social sector, but something increasingly that we're seeing being adopted in the private sector and the public sector, and we need all of these parties coming together. So um, George has been really visionary that way, and we're so grateful to have him here today. Uh, please welcome George Constantinescu. Thank you, Peter, um, and good afternoon all. Um, it's been a privilege for me to uh, share these last couple of days with you. Uh, you are truly an inspirational group, and um, I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I'm very, very buoyed and very optimistic about uh, our future when I see people like you uh, putting in the kinds of efforts and uh, the type of thinking that uh, you've demonstrated over the last couple of days. So I'd just like to begin with expressing my own personal gratitude uh, for uh, you allowing me to be part of your, your process for the last two days. Um, like Leonard last night, I'm getting old and I, I do have to write things down lest I forget them, so you'll forgive me if I refer to my notes. Um, but um, um, I would like to begin by just expressing my great pleasure uh, and an honor to stand before you today and celebrate your outstanding achievements in this global competition. Each one of you has demonstrated exceptional curiosity, ingenuity, um, dedication, and the capacity for a lot of hard work in pursuit of an enlightened understanding of your subjects. And I, and I think you'll agree that the real prize of the competition is the opportunity to spend the last few days learning uh, about all the interesting subjects that we've, we've been exposed to uh, in the company of such an inspiring group of peers and educators uh, in a program so beautifully orchestrated by the Skoll Center and the Said Business School. I'd like to extend my congratulations to you all. I've heard a quote that really resonated with me, which I'll share with you today. Uh, it, it goes, we can ignore reality, but we can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. I live in the commercial world, where money can be made by exploiting the differences between perceptions and reality. And that, frankly, has never sat comfortably with me. Aside from the moral considerations, fundamentally, those commercial models are not sustainable. And clearly, we are in an epoch where sustainability is critical. I feel very strongly that tackling any of the myriad challenges confronting our world today, um, it's essential that we begin as, with as complete a factual understanding of those subjects or of reality as possible. And then we have to use that understanding to formulate the most beautiful question, the most inspired opportunity statement to guide our actions. 
It is the efficacy of system thinking in facilitating this process that makes it, in my opinion, fundamental. And I do believe that it is universally applicable, as Peter just mentioned. Your journey through this competition has undoubtedly sharpened your skills in system thinking, helping you navigate the intricate web of interconnected factors that shape our world. Your ability to look beyond isolated incidents and perceive the broader context, recognizing the relationships, the feedback loops, the unintended consequences, and sometimes contradictions that underlie complex real-world problems. Your ability to recognize opportunities for interventions and to calibrate the inevitable trade-offs involved. As you continue your life journeys, I hope that you will find the courage to apply all that you have learned through this experience, even when all incentives seem to point you in the opposite direction, towards the expeditious. Embrace the pursuit of objective truths, anchored in rigorous evidence and reliable sources. Seek diverse perspectives and challenge assumptions to reveal the full spectrum of possibilities. Employ critical thinking in all its forms, questioning, evaluating, and synthesizing information to uncover profound insights that others may overlook. And always make a little room in your process for the counterpoints, for there are very few absolutes in life. Our soundbite-dominated world, with its polarizing superficialities, needs your skills in navigating complexity, in understanding the interplay of factors that shape our societies, economies, and environments. Leverage that understanding to shape the world into one we all aspire to live in. Be generous with your gifts. Before I conclude, on behalf of myself and Nancy Southern, my boss and our chief executive officer, and the rest of my ATCO colleagues, I would like to express our immense pleasure in providing financial support to this remarkable program. We firmly believe in the power of education, research, and collaboration to drive progress and shape a better future. By investing in MAP the system, we invest in you, the change makers of tomorrow. We trust that you will carry this experience with you to your careers, spreading your impact far and wide. And we hope that for some of you, pursuing that path to making a better world will be within ATCO. Once again, my congratulations to all finalists. Your dedication and curiosity inspire us all and we eagerly await the transformative ideas that will emerge from your beautiful minds. I wish you all great success in all your future endeavors. And with that, I'd like to invite you to, should you have any questions for me, please feel free. Thank you, George. I've got some roaming mics, uh, and we've got a few minutes um, for anyone who has a question. Nobody wants to know why I'm polluting your academic exercise with the commercial presence. <laughs> <laughs> no. Could I get these roaming mics on? The handhelds. Here you go. Mm -hmm. I was trying to wait for a student, but I can always have a question. Uh, I appreciate the generosity with which you spoke to, um, and the nuance to how we balance, uh, as we talk about in here, like profit and purpose. And so could you talk about maybe some moments where that's felt uh, the most intense and difficult to navigate, and how you approach those situations? Oh, that's such a... Fascinating question and uh, so, such an expansive one. Um, one of the um, 
one of the fundamental issues in, in kind of doing the right thing and doing the, the thing that is permissible. Uh, uh, f finds its, its kind of presence in, um, how can I put it, um, the incentives that we're all kind of faced with. One of the issues that you have uh, in the corporate world is that the incentives don't always align with your aspirations to do things that are more long-term uh, and, and sustainable and um, you know, everything is, is focused more, more tactically, uh, more in the immediate term. And certainly public companies have this issue where there are um, expectations that have to be met um, and the, the, the markets have expectations that um, they, they reward or punish you for meeting or not meeting. Uh, and uh, so to find the way in which you can um, navigate both these worlds, and both are valid, by the way, um, in order to be able to get to 20 years from now, you have to survive tomorrow. That, that, that is a reality. Um, and so exploring that polarity, and truly it is a polarity, is the real challenge. Um, and in a lot of ways, one has to hold almost uh, opposing values uh, equally dear uh, in order to be able to do that. The, the business of here and now is focused on certainty. Uh, the, the business of tomorrow is focused on possibility. Uh, and so uh, they're both right. It's just that the contexts are very different and being able to approach it in a sophisticated way, recognizing that there are different contexts and allowing for all of that to happen within a single organization is the biggest challenge. Um, and that's a sophisticated conversation which not everybody is willing to engage in. Uh, and the thing that I really love about the work that you're doing is that it's all about sophisticated conversation. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I am roving. Glad I wore my trainers today. Skull orange, if you haven't noticed. There you are, my dear. Thank you. So I find it really interesting how companies pick the cause that they stand behind, because a lot of them seem to pick kind of that end tactical thing. And so tell us how, why map the system? Because it just seems like a really interesting, unique way to invest in, in tomorrow. Well, um, be, the short answer is because it was serendipity. Uh, I, I became exposed to map the system through a, a chance meeting with uh, our neighbors at Mount Royal Uni University. Um, and uh, the, the thing that resonated with me is that it sought to address some shortcomings that I recognize in, in, in my corporate structure. Uh, my role is to, in I guess in very, very short uh, terms, is, is to look for the secret of corporate immortality. That, that really is what I've been charged with. Um, uh, I, I don't think it exists, by the way. Uh, but, but longevity certainly does, and the, the capacity to, to procreate, if you will, to, to spin off things which will live, which will outlive the parent entity. Uh, I, I think that is where, where promise exists. Well, it, 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 it certainly seemed to me that um, the, the way that Map the System approached uh, the complexity of the world um, and sought to uh, address difficult to solve uh, problems in the social space had a direct parallel to, to the corporate world. And uh, there is this very compelling parallel, I find, between the work that needs to be done uh, in, in both places. Their financial sustainability is essential in the, in the social space uh, because if you have a solution that will only live until the end of funding, well, that's not really a solution. That's just kind of an interesting experiment. So finding some kind of a commercially viable model where you can deploy that solution on an ongoing basis is, is part of finding a solution. And, and likewise, uh, if you think that you're just going to make money 
uh, and not really align yourself with social values and, and you know, things that are important to society. Well, again, that's very short-lived. Um, you, you may be able to do that, and some people have done that for a short period of time, but, but there, there's definitely an end date to it. Um, and again, I'm privileged to, to be given, I, I work for a family-controlled uh, company, and legacy means something different to, to, to us. And so I have the privilege of looking in the long term. I don't have the luxury of saying, I'm a rapacious capitalist and I'm going to make as much money as I can in the next three years and then I'm going to get out. And, uh, that, that's not the way I view the world. I view the world in much more sustainable terms. And I think there's a direct parallel between those two, two worlds. So I, I suppose that's kind of how we came to it. It seems like it's a solution that applies itself equally effectively in both places. I think we're going to have to call it there. George, thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you very much. Good job. Thanks again, George. My pleasure. Okay. Next up, I noticed, by the way, oh, thank you, Jamie, um, that Zaid, who, as you know, among other things, is one of our judges, has emerged for his remarks but he was not accompanied by the other judges. What that means? Your guess is as good as mine. Um, he took my microphone. Um, so at this time, we may need you to drag out your remarks if your colleagues can't get their act together. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at this time, it's a, a real pleasure to introduce uh, Zaid Hassan. Um, his, his bio is in the brief, and so I'm not going to read it all out, but um, uh, Zaid is someone we've known for a long time. He is a serial entrepreneur who, as far as I can tell, has at least three ventures going uh, right now, including 10 and 10, um, which is trying to tackle 10 global challenges in 10 years. Uh, uh, the Gigaton Challenge, which is a global response to the climate crisis, and a really cool um, uh, venture called Complexity University. He's been doing this work for a long time. He's been doing it with big organizations, with small communities um, and coalitions of community-based groups, and one of the smartest people I know working in this space, and it's rooted in, uh, in deep practical experience. So we're really honored to have you. Zaid, please welcome him. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. That's super kind of you. So we're going to do a little tech test. My job, obviously, uh, the next 15 minutes is to distract you from what's coming. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. So has everyone got these cards? Uh, and also just a big thank you to Jane, Alice's mom, for getting these for us, because uh, we didn't get them in time. But um, we're going to do a little vote. The uh, question I'm going to ask you is, how anxious are you about the results? So uh, if you're very anxious, red. If you're not anxious at all, green, if you don't care. And if you're a little bit anxious, so just, just I'm going to count to three and then do your vote, yeah? So just think about it. Channel, channel. Get in touch with your feelings. One, two, three. Hold up your cards. Look around the room. Look around the room. All right. OK. All right, that's the mood in the room. Yes, you only have two red cards there. A couple of red cards, mostly green. Wow, everyone's really calm, I'm, I'm impressed. So here's how I'm gonna distract you. I'm gonna talk about something um, that we're doing called Gigaton, which is a response to the climate crisis, as Peter said. Um, is there a clicker? Yeah. Is it here? Yeah. So it's a, global, it's a response to the global climate crisis. Uh, we've been working on it for a long time. I'm going to run through this relatively quickly, and if we can get to a Q&A, that will be good, as it might make more sense to talk about it than me to present. So here's the situation we're in. Global greenhouse gases need to peak within 96 months. That's when we run out of our carbon budget and decline by 1 billion tons a year. So there's a little, little that's what peaking looks like, right? It's going up at the moment. So at the moment, emissions are going up. Uh, and they need, to, they need to peak and decline within this time period. If they don't, uh, we have a problem. So here's a question for all of you. I know, obviously, you're not, all, you're not all familiar necessarily with the climate crisis or what's happening, 
But given this is a situation, this is what needs to happen. This is what the science is saying needs to happen. What's your best guess as to whether we have a peaking strategy or not? So if, we, if you think we don't have one, it's a red card. If you think we have one and it's going to work, it's a green card. If you don't know, then it's a yellow card. So just one, two, three. One, two, three. OK, so just look around the room. So mostly yellow, some green, and a bunch of reds, yeah? All right, that's helpful. OK, so that's the vote. So here's, the, here's where we are, right? Um, in 1992, the Rio Earth Summit happened, and that's basically when the UN system decided that we're going to tackle climate change. Now, since then, 50% of, of all of humanity's emissions have happened since Rio, since, since we decided to tackle the crisis. You're <laughs> um, which is kind of sobering. So it's like, since we decided to tackle the crisis, 50% of all human emissions have happened, and they're going up. So um, if we implement the current pledges that, are, that have been made um, with technology that exists, then we're basically locked into, depending on who you ask, plus 2 degrees, 2.5 to 3.5. If we go over 3 degrees, we're likely to lose global agriculture. So you're likely not to be able to farm. So there's 50 degrees outside, 60, you know, 54 degrees. It's very hard as a farmer for you to go out and farm. You can't go outside. When you do go outside, your crops will be dead. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. That's what we're locked into at the moment. Yeah? Not good. So I would argue that we don't have a strategy that adds up, even on paper. So if the current pledges are met and we still are in overshoot, we're still going to we're still going to hit that that number of you know plus three, then I would argue we don't have a strategy, and that's currently where we are. Um, we know lots about the climate crisis. We know where the science is. We know where the consensus is. So it isn't that we don't know, and we're waiting to know and we're waiting for research to tell us what's going to happen. Yeah. So uh, I'm now going to share what we're doing. Um, so Gigaton is a, is a distributed strategy. And there was, um, we worked on this for a long time. And we had one insight, um, maybe about four years ago, um, that we started operationalizing. Um, and this was the insight, that imagine you had 1,000 teams committed to reducing global emissions um, per year. All right? So the target is one gigaton, which is a billion tons a year. A billion tons is all of Germany's emissions in one year, all, all of Africa's emissions in one year. So it's quite a large number. Current emissions are about 50 gigatons a year. So if you had, imagine you had 1,000 teams committed to that target. Um, the target per team is one megaton, basically. So you split that 1 billion into 1,000 by 1,000. Um, yeah, so that's the target per team. Make sense? Yes? OK, so imagine you have 2,000 teams. What happens to your target? Thank you, mathematician. <laughs> the target basically drops to half, right? Half a megaton. If you have 3,000 teams, it drops to a third. So basically, the insight was the more teams you have, the easier it is to essentially meet the target. And the easier it is for each team to meet their target. Does that make sense? Super clear? Yeah? OK. So basically, what we've been doing is, since, um, since we launched 24 months ago, we have been essentially training and financing teams to take effective climate action. Um, and we've, set a set of, we've got a set of standards for effective climate action. Um, the standards can be met by anybody, so they're public, they're public standards. Um, and as long as you meet the standards, we will support you and finance you. So what we do is we train teams. Now, the train teams can be government departments. They could be informal groups. They could be groups of students. Um, and basically, there are three targets. So there's a, what we call a temporal target. So there's a time-bound target. So things need to happen within a certain time frame. Um, there's an abatement target or emissions reduction target. So emissions need to go down a certain amount. And there's what we call an equity target. So an equity target is that you have to provide benefits to families that are in the bottom 20% income bracket, wherever you live, wherever your team is. And the benefits are one of three, so or all three. Uh, so one is jobs, the other is energy security, and the other is food security. So I'll give you an example. At level one, so we've got seven levels. At level one, your target is one ton of emissions reduction in two weeks. So as somebody said when we, when we first kind of launched this, I said, do you mean you actually want us to do it or write a proposal to do it? I said, no, I don't want you to write a proposal to do it. We want you to actually do it. And a lot of teams that came to us basically said, well, it just can't be done. Um, and so uh, one ton of emissions reduction, for example, is about 750 kilos of food waste. And if it, instead of it going to landfill or being burnt, you compost it, 
you save a ton, basically. So level two, it's 10 tons. Uh, and then essentially, the, the targets go up 10 times each level. Equity targets start at level three, where you have to provide support to 100 families. Um, they go up also 10 times to so level four. It's 1,000 families, and so on and so forth. So basically, the idea is that that's what effective climate action looks like. If you can essentially meet our standards, so we can train teams, we train teams. If they meet our standard, we finance those teams, basically. And the amount of money you get paid also goes up 10 times each level. Make sense? OK, you can ask questions in a minute. So one way of thinking about the challenge is that we've got 120 months. Forget about years. Think in months. Um, we run sprints in six-month cycles. So teams work in six-month cycles to meet their targets. So you can imagine that we've basically got 240 sprints. And if we, can, if we can essentially get enough teams up and running, um, we have a solution, at least to the emissions crisis. But also, we can essentially create millions of jobs and impact up to a billion families. So here's the question, right? Can we get 1,000 teams live within 24 months? <clears throat> um, before we go there, I'm just going to tell you a story of our best performing team. So our best performing team is a group of 20-year-olds. And they're in India, so they're in a town in India on the East Coast. And um, when they started, um, so they basically came to us and said, you know, can you train us to do this stuff? And, and um, they put together a little bit of money and said, we'll pay for our training. Um, so we trained them, and they basically didn't speak English, and they had one cell phone between them. And they basically said to us for, for, the, for level one, they said, what do you want us to do? We said, one ton of emissions. And they said, we don't know what that means. What does that mean? We said, 750 kilos of food waste. And they said, oh, OK. So they went and got a weighing scale, and they started weighing food waste in their offices. And they came back to us about a week later and said, we're done. Now what do you want us to do? Then we said, OK, it's 10 tons. And they said, oh, so that's 7.5 tons of food waste. And we said, yeah. They said, well, we, we don't have anything to transport it with. Can you give us $200 for transport? So we gave them $200 for transport. They came back uh, in two weeks, and they said, we're done. Now what do you want us to do? So this, the interesting thing about this team is they're a sports team. So they basically are young 20-year-olds. They typically do blue-collar jobs. They do sport every day. They play. They practice the sport called kabaddi. Um, and they basically have just completed level four, where they basically have provided support to over 1,000 families. Um, they've collected 100,000 kilos of food waste every month for six months. Um, They've provided biogas to families. Um, they now have a bunch of EVs that they use to collect their food waste. They employ about 250 people. Um, so that's what they're doing. And they're our best performing team at the moment. So the thing we want to vote on is, can we get 1,000 teams live within 24 months in your assessment? I'm going to count to three. One. And so the, the hint is there's some teams in the room, right? It's like some of you. So can we do that? One, two, three. Hold your cards up. Have a look around. All right. Greens and yellows. All right. Good. So um, this is kind of the, this is the claim that I'm making. I, I'm actually saying that we could probably tackle the climate crisis within 60 months in a significant way, not in a it feels good, but nothing's really happening, but a significant way, metrics, numbers, employment, emissions reduction. That's the claim I'm making. I think we can do it. Uh, that's kind of it. Um, when I first started doing this work, I heard this phrase, and it kind of sums up the challenge perfectly, that we've got a time challenge. There's a timetable that's being set by the science, and if we don't meet the timetable, we will be locked into you know, plus 2 degrees, 3.5 degrees. Uh, so that's the challenge, and speed is the solution. I'm going to stop questions. Um, so basically, what we've been doing over the last 24 months is we've been testing it. So we've tested it probably with kind of 90 plus teams around the world. Um, and we've had teams. Is Evan here? Evan. Uh, does someone want to give the mic to Evan? Evan's one of our teams from Hawaii. And he's visiting Oxford today from Hawaii. So, so we've tested it with a lot of teams. Evan, I don't know if you want to say anything about your experience. It's like, don't listen to that man. <laughs> yeah, he's crazy. Don't listen to him. <laughs> um, yeah, we put together a team in Hawaii in, what, 2022? Mm -hmm. Ran for about six months. Um, basically, I went around and asked six people to kind of help me divert food waste and compost and turn it into soil for our farmers, which is a really effective story to tell people. 
And um, yeah, we diverted about 35, 40 tons of cardboard and food waste, partnered with a local composter, got it composted, sent it to community gardens and local farmers, which equated to about 77 tons of emissions. Yeah. Um, and it took about five people and f five months and a couple of yeses and a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah, thanks. Yes. So basically what happens is all teams start with food waste and what happened is over the last kind of 24 months again we tested this so we tested it where we basically said to teams you can do one ton do whatever you want and then occasionally teams would come up with like the craziest ideas and then we would kind of go that's really not going to work and they'd say no no it's a great idea we think it's going to work they would test it it wouldn't work so we started saying to teams all of you are going to start with food waste because it's ubiquitous so food waste for a country would be the third largest emitter in the world after the US and China um, but what happens is that as soon as you start collecting enough food waste, you've got a transport issue. Yeah. So once you're dealing with tons of food waste, so you've got to then build a zero emissions transport network. Um, so people typically would use cargo bikes, but also expand to EVs once the volume gets high enough. Um, they're also using the compost to grow food. Um, so then there's a land use issue. So people are using land. So what, do you, what kind of agriculture are you practicing? Is it regenerative? Is it monocropping? Um, there's a renewable energy issue, so they, essentially the idea is you start with a relatively simple technical problem, which is collect a bunch of food waste and compost it, and then you expand your range of activities as you go up levels to much more complex challenges, which require much more than technical proficiency. Um, so they will end up doing seven or eight different things over time as they graduate up the levels, basically. Yeah, other questions? Oh, I'm just wondering, if, are these teams grassroots or do you think about collaborate with government or are there like teams of lobbyists? Right, so, so, so remember the, the point is that they actually do the work, right? So they're not lobbying to do the work, they're actually doing the work. But you could have teams inside corporations um, that are actually working on their, you know, what we, you would call scope one emissions. We've had government departments um, join. We've had multi-stakeholder teams that have come from government join. So that, that the goal would be that teams can come from anywhere, whether that's inside a corporation, inside a government, or a multi-stakeholder team, or an informal group of students, for example, um, or an informal group of people like Evan put together in Hawaii, basically. But the idea also is that um, at each level, we can provide the financing. So we also there's a more complicated discussion about how we do the financing. Um, but the idea is anybody could do it. And the standards are public and available, and you can see them, and you can go in trainings and courses and learn how to do it, basically. Does that answer your question? Uh, another question. Do you, uh, teams develop other teams? Or is it yeah. from top down? Oh, yeah, so, so um, one way to think about an L5 team, it's, it's 10 L4 teams. So for example, the team we have in India, the Vizag team, the team I was telling you about, um, they, during their L4 sprint, started testing it with, with other teams outside. So, so it was super interesting. They came back to us and they said, look, we're going to run a test with some students in another part of the state. Um, and we came back, there, so they came back and said, how'd it go? And they said, oh, you know, these kids have much more energy than we do. These are 20 year olds, okay? And we're like, what are you talking about? And they said, they were done within five days. Um, and they're ready to go, so they're ready to go. And can we find 10 more teams in the state? Yes, we can. So the idea is that each team would also spawn other teams and find other teams to mentor and support and grow, basically. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's OK. Other questions or thoughts? Yes. Have you ever had a team uh, go backwards where they met a goal and then a month later they didn't? They went backwards as in they went what? Uh, as in they met a goal for a month and then afterwards they didn't meet the goal anymore? Oh, totally. And if so, what did you do about it? Yeah, so let me just tell you one, one quick story. So um, we had a team in South Africa, and um, what, what happens is at the beginning of Sprint, we pay teams in advance every month. And the idea is that they've got targets and goals, they meet them, we pay them. So we paid them for the first month, and we have two coaches to support each team. And the coaches called me sort of, I don't know, four weeks, three weeks later, and they said, look, we're not getting anything. And I said, what do you mean? They said, we're not getting anything from the team. Like, they're not talking to us. They're just silent. And I said, oh, that's, that's not good. What, what are you going to do? And they said, oh, we've created this 24-page questionnaire, and we're going to force them to answer this questionnaire. And I was like, don't do that. <laughs> that's not a good idea. So they said, what should we do? I said, well, clearly they have a problem, um, and they're not talking to us because they have a problem. So why don't we find out what the problem is? 
So I was like, don't send them a questionnaire. And I started WhatsApping the team. And it took about four days. And then someone responded and said, yes, we've got a problem. I said, what's the problem? They said, we ran out of money. So we're supposed to build these compost boxes where the compost comes in. And we run out of money. We can't build the compost boxes, so nothing's happening. And I was like, oh, OK, how much would it cost to complete building the compost boxes? So they go, $200. So I was like, if I send you $200, will you complete building the compost boxes? And they go, yeah. So we send them $200. They complete building the compost boxes, and they're online. Suddenly, they're responding to messages, and they're talking to us. When we had a conversation with them afterwards, what we said to them is, look, if you have a problem, tell us, right? And we will help you solve the problem. So we're not going to punish you. Um, and we're not going to basically say, OK, well, you haven't met these targets. Therefore, we're going to now stop funding you and financing you. If you have a problem, we'll solve the problem. Obviously, if the problem keeps repeating, that's a different story. The other thing we said to them is we said, don't fake the data. right? So if you basically do your collections and you lose your data book, tell us. Don't be like, oh, shoot, we lost the data book. Therefore, we're just going to fake the data. And we're like, don't do that. Don't fake the data. So the rules of the game are, we'll tell you what the rules of the game are. We're going to support you as long as you continue to follow the rules of the game. And the rules of the game are, you can mess up. You can make a mistake. As long as we figure out what to do and recover from it, we're OK. Conversely, we've had teams who basically have dropped out and said, it can't be done. Right? So we had a team in New York at the same time as the team in India. And they, were all, they all had doctorates and <laughs> impressive sustainability credentials. And they said, what do you want us to do? And we said, one ton in two weeks. And they said, it can't be done. And they did do a PowerPoint deck. <laughs> but they dropped out. It was like, this is not for you, basically. So it is action oriented. It's like you've got to deliver on what you're doing. It's not a theory. You're not writing a paper about it. You're actually kind of doing the work. Karen? Is it possible for teams to pause? Like in Canada, yes. there's a lot yes. of pace at schools. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible to pause. So you could do a six-month cycle pause and then basically say, we need time. So we have a team in, um, in the Grand Canaries that's working with schools. So they work according to school terms, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. No, so we've got teams in India, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the Middle East, um, you know, some starting in Latin America. So they're all over the world. And the idea is we'll focus primarily in the global south, just because financing is a little bit easier. Um, but we've partnered with lots of organizations. Like we've partnered with the German government um, and their the development agency. So they finance lots of, they have offices in lots of countries in the global south. So they give us teams, basically. Um, we've also run outreach campaigns, literally on kind of Facebook, where we run Facebook and Instagram campaigns to recruit teams. There is no shortage of people wanting to do the work. Yeah? Time? How are we doing on time? If there's one more burning question, we can do it. Otherwise, we're ready to move on. One more burning question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, kind of basing on the question that was just asked, um, what are some of the areas or places or countries that you're looking at to expand this project? And before you even do that, what are some of the things that you look at to scale? I mean, honestly, so we've, we've got teams in a lot of different places. Um, we're looking to expand in countries we have teams. But if there is a new country that wants to come online, then are there partners and people who can help us deliver it? But you know, we've got teams in Kenya, Uganda, South Africa. Um, but it, it will expand. Um, and partly, it's kind of a function of finance, but we're trying to crack that so that we could actually have teams from anywhere. But where are you from? I'm Ethiopian, so from Ethiopia. Great. <laughs> Let's yeah, go. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Zaid. All right. Judges, come on down. Thank you once again to uh, both of our speakers this afternoon for, for really fascinating and, 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 and different perspectives um, on this issue. And, uh, and thanks especially to Zaid for rushing between the Chamber of Secrets and right back here to uh, regale us with his work. Um, <laughs> OK. So. It is now time 
for the final event of the week. Think about where we've come from, by the way. You arrived last week, what, Tuesday? All nervous. The Oxford pixie dust. I can't believe I'm here. We've had a really good week. Have we not? Yeah. We've learned something. We've met a whole bunch of interesting people from all over the world. I think we've all been sparked to think about some aspect of the world or ourselves or our work a little bit differently. We carried uh, days of learning off into the evening into the pubs and cafes of Oxford, which is where most of the good work actually happens. We had a terrific dinner last evening and, uh, and obviously wonderful uh, pitches both yesterday and today. Um, so what we're going to do now, I'll just t take you through the running order. First, we are going to ask uh, a couple of our judges to say a few words of reflection um, on behalf of our wonderful judging panel. Um, and then they and Alice and others will assist me in uh, delivering the awards. We'll start with the Excellence Awards, uh, which are uh, a, a bunch of different categories of awards to uh, finalists um, who did not present today. And then we will announce the first, second, uh, third prize and runners up for the uh, six teams who did present today. And then we'll celebrate and take lots of pictures. Um, so with that, I am going to introduce Tanya Aritao and Claire Wathen. Hello, everyone. It's been a huge honor to be a judge and be part of the group of judges this year. Um, I know you're holding your breaths for everything that's happening after, but um, first I wanted to recognize how all of the issues that you've tackled, that you've studied, how they matter, how much you matter, how, you, how the time you put into this matter. And I hope that the competition part doesn't take away from just how you've fall in love with understanding the problems that you're facing and the issues that you care about. So please walk away with that, knowing that what you've done makes a difference and that matters. Um, embrace the new ways of thinking, as we mentioned yesterday, that once you've seen an issue in, in the system in the way you have when you've studied it, you can't unsee it. And it's this thing that you start telling other people about and starts um, bringing about other change. Uh, we also wanted, as judges, to recognize just the quality of the work that has come through this year. Um, and we know that that's months in the making. That's time that you've put in, heart, maybe some tears, maybe some um, interesting discussions with each other. And just to honor that, that you've put in so much into that. And it really, really shows in the submissions that you've made. The last thing I'd like to do before I hand it over to Claire is to give everyone just a moment to take a deep breath. Ooh, there's a lot of breath that needs to be taken in the room. Um, and maybe just I'll give you some moments of silence where you can think about what you are personally taking away from this experience. So just in your own mind, think about what is something you've gained or something that you've learned or a takeaway. And I'm just going to let the room be silent for a few moments so you can have that space to think. Great, and just recognize and acknowledge that for yourselves and that hopefully that's something that you can embrace moving forward and move into action from here. Thank you, Tanya. Um, first, on behalf of all of the judges, we wanna say thank you for making our job so challenging. We had a heated debate that went on several times longer than we were supposed to. So first, thanks for being flexible with us. And it really speaks to the quality of the work that you've brought forward, the context, the dynamics, the tools, the insights that you've brought forward. It's really extraordinary to see the diversity of approaches, even with something shared from a criteria standpoint, things that we as judges were all looking at and bringing different points of view into. Um, there was so many different points of view that um, it brought up for all of us who are familiar with this kind of work. And you know, on behalf of the Skoll Foundation, this is really ongoing work. It's how we can think about the world, think about not just one specific context or system, but how those are deeply interrelated as well. Whether you're talking about climate action or pandemics or gender rights or fill in the blank. There are all kinds of interrelated systems, dynamics, and people. And at the end of the day, it is really 
um, a matter of relationships and being able to build bridges across expected and unexpected areas of a different kind of system, depending on what you're looking at. And so we'd also like to invite you to think of this experience as the start and not as the conclusion. Um, think about the kind of system that you represent, the networks that you represent, that you brought here to Oxford, the kinds of connections you've made in this room, beyond this room, and invite you to also think of all of us as resources and, and collaborators as you move forward. We hope that this is not the end of these challenging dynamics that you're exploring, but really the beginning. And so if, as you think about people that you would like to connect with, things that you're looking to explore, really think about the Oxford network of networks that you have at your fingertips, the School Center network, the School Foundation network. Really, it is about how do we collectively join? How do we collectively move forward? And so um, I'm so inspired and enthused just looking at the room and seeing the kinds of energy that's here and what you've brought into the dynamic and what that can mean for our field. So on behalf of the foundation, on behalf of all of our judges, just a very big thank you. And let's give yourselves a big round of applause. Thank you, Claire and Tanya. Yeah, stay, stay up here. You can help us. Um, so the, the upshot of, of those remarks is, uh, you know, you're, you're part of this now. You're part of us. You're part of Oxford. You're part of the school community. And we're part of you. So you're stuck with us, whether you like it or not. Don't be strangers. We're going to do the Excellence Awards right now. Um, Tanya and Claire are going to help to hand them out, along with Alice. Can we say hi to Alice, by the way? How amazing is she? You come over here. Okay. Love you, Alice. Love you too. <laughs> Love you all. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna call up the um, the awards. I'll I'll tell you about the categories. Some of them have more than one team. What we're gonna ask so that everyone can come and receive their certificates, have a photo, and a well deserved round of applause is that when uh, when I call your your team out. Come on down, please, educators as well. Okay, come up this side. You'll get your certificates and a photo and all that good stuff, and then you'll come down that side. You know, it's a bit like a graduation ceremony. You gotta keep it moving. Okay, so the first award is, um, do you wanna stand uh, here a little bit? Yeah. Here, to the photographer can tell you. Okay, so the first award is um, uh, excellent uh, undergraduate presentation. We recognize that um, you know, one of the challenges that we put out there is that this is any kind of tertiary institution. We have PhDs and postdocs and postgrads and MBAs and undergraduates, et cetera. And, uh, and it's particularly remarkable when undergraduate teams um, uh, you know, do the, the caliber of work that we've seen all weekend. And we've got four uh, teams that we would like to recognize with uh, excellence uh, for an undergraduate team award. Uh, that is uh, Ashesi University. <laughs> Next up is Corpus Christi College. Come on down, Corpus Christi. All right. Enter stage right, exit stage left. Congratulations. Hey, really impressed with your work. Thank you. Cheers. Hey, congratulations. Oh, you're such a big team. Come on in here. We may have to.
Thank you. Okay, next up uh, for the excellence for uh, an exceptional project from an undergraduate entry goes to Universidad de Anahuac, Mexico. And our final award in this category goes to the University of British Columbia. Come on down, please. Stage right. We do. Congratulations. Thank you. Really proud of you. Come on over. Yeah, we got to stay centered here. See? Uh -huh. It's so subtle. Thank you, UBC. Okay, our next category is Excellence Award for an Exceptional Project from a Newcomer Institution. This is recognizing that uh, another scale of challenge that, you know, map the system is a different way of doing things, um, and we rely a lot on our amazing educators as well. So this award is to recognize uh, a team from a university that's participating for the first time. Um, and we're really proud um, to recognize the team from McAllister College. Please come on down. Thank you. Our next category is Excellence Award for Involvement of Underrepresented Community Voices. Uh, and, and I'm really pleased, actually, to say that this award, you know, really could have gone to many, many teams um, throughout, the, throughout the final. And I think it's a, a testament to, um, to your commitment to doing this in the right way. But uh, for this particular award, we're pleased to honor King's College Nepal. Please come on down. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Uh, our next category, um, Excellence Award for Systems Collaboration. Uh, this is uh, an award for teams that really put the idea of 
not collaboration, but collaboration into practice, oftentimes in the design of their team or in the ways that they work, um, moving outside of the classroom into the community and working with other key stakeholders and uh, in, in really novel ways. And we have uh, two awards in this particular category, which uh, is one of my favorites. And the first is to the University of Oxford. Please welcome. <laughs> Okay, and, and our other award for excellence uh, in systems collaboration goes to our friends at University College London. Please come on down. All right, and our final category of excellence awards, this is called the Excellence Award for a Highly Commended Project. And that is exactly what it sounds like. It's a very British thing to say. Um, these are just excellent all around projects that we just really, really loved and wanted to recognize. Um, and there are three of them. Um, and the first is Charles University. Come on down. <laughs> Our next Excellence Award for Highly Commended Project goes to the University of Calgary. Slide down a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, folks. And our final excellence award in the highly commended project category goes to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill.
Thank you. Are you keen? Are you, you're okay. Your stamina is high. Okay. So I'd love for all the three of you to stay up. And uh, George, would you do me the honor of coming to help hand out the, uh, the subsequent awards? Come on down, George. So if you want to join Alice, I'll hand you the certificates and you can walk down. Okay. 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 Um, what's that? Okay. Um, <laughs> I should have asked, is it supposed to be ha, like ha 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 or ha <laughs> um, Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna um, announce the third place, then the second place, then the first place, uh, and then we'll also honor those with a runner-up award as well. Um, we have two third place awards. And the first one goes to Vanderbilt University. And if there was a award for improvisation, I mean, it would go to Vanderbilt as well. Okay, our other third place winner. You don't, you don't have to duck. <laughs> we can see you even if you've ducked down. Um, our, our other third place winner goes to National Taiwan University. Congratulations. Terrific. Well done. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay. I, everyone is permitted to walk at full height, should they, should they choose to. And if you want to do the duck walk, that's okay. All right. Second prize. Oh, this is exciting. American University in Beirut. Okay.
And the winner of the Map the System Global Final 2023 is... <laughs> Wesleyan University, come on down. Thank you so much. I'm sensing a little bit of shock. This is great. Um, gosh, this was difficult, right, as you can see by the judges' deliberations, which went on and on and on and on and on. Um, let's uh, please now celebrate. And then they kicked me out. And then they kicked. And then they go faster. I think, exactly. <laughs> that I believe. <laughs> OK. Um, we have two more phenomenal, phenomenal finalists to recognize here today um, as very worthy runners-up. Um, let's begin with Athabasca University. And we're our friends from University of Haifa. Please come on down. Let's give all 17 teams another great round of applause. You can return now to your seats. Um, I told you there's going to be a lot of gratitude today, so we need to take care of our, our gratitude business uh, before we, we close and wander off into this beautiful evening. Um, lots of people to thank. I first want to recognize our uh, wonderful judges. Um, so why don't we ask all the judges to stand up so we can just give you a big round of applause. In fact, come on down front, come on down front. I know, I just said sit down. Oh, sure. <laughs> so the, sure, why not? Whether you like them or not, why not? Okay, 
Um, the Yellow Submarine is a phenomenal uh, social enterprise right around the corner from us uh, that uh, runs a couple of amazing cafes uh, to train and work with uh, young adults with autism and other disabilities. They're phenomenal. They make really good food. We love them. And they have made some wonderful cakes and cookies for our judges. Thank you. Should we do a photo? Did you do a photo? Uh-huh. All right. Why not? In the Cookies in the picture. Oh, those smell good. I hope we have an extra box somewhere. Okay. Uh, next up, I want to recognize our educators once more. Um, we, we had a really good time this week. It was the first year that we did an educator uh, program. And um, I learned a lot, and uh, I think we all did. Uh, and I think we really saw the value of trying to build this community. And, and the reason that this, this program has grown every year and that it's grown stronger every year, the reason that, as I told you yesterday, just about any one of these um, uh, presentations and projects this year, um, you know, would probably have won the, the global competition a couple of years ago. That's just how much the quality of your work increases year after year after year. And that's a huge credit to our educators. So I wanna just ask them all to come down one more time, please, so we can recognize you. Probably only have enough for one for each institution, so they'll have to share. We'll do both. So the, the little gift we've offered to the educators is a little book. Yeah, come on, Haifa. Yeah. Come on down. <laughs> yeah, please come take a photo with me. Mm -hmm. We're almost there. We're almost there. Thank you. Thank you. Bronwyn? Bronwyn, do you want to come? So the, the little gift we've offered the educators, I think is kind of an unlikely one. It's a little book called Letters to My Future Self. It's a series of, um, of blank letters and envelopes that you write to a future version of yourself, and you seal them away until said date. And it's the sort of thing we love to do with our incoming students. Uh, but this time, in the spirit of perpetual growth and lifelong learning, we're inviting our educators to do the same. OK, thank you. The very last thing is I'm now going to turn it over to Bronwyn to say a few words of closing. Um, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to take the opportunity um, just to thank the incredible staff at the Skoll Center for the work that they have done. Um, particularly one person um, who works on Map the System all year round. So the staff that you see around this week have been helping for mostly this week in the run-up to the event of Map the System. But Map the System is so much more than that. It's building the Canvas page, updating all the resources, sending emails to all the students, sending emails to all the educators, onboarding new educators, 
etc. Organizing the Oxford global, the Oxford final, and then the semi-finals online for the first time this year, and then the global final event. And the person that holds all these relationships and all these spaces and all these moving parts is Alice Luca. So thank you so much, Alice. And a huge bunch of applause. And um, I think all of you, all of you know how, how deeply Alice cares about our educators and our students um, in this program, and she does it with so much thoughtfulness and kindness um, and models that for the rest of our team. Um, I would also like to call the rest of the Skoll Center team on stage, please, to thank you so much for supporting the event. <laughs> Alan Groom, Sophie. Sino. I know. Slide down, slide down. DJ Sino. From, from designing the learning program, to helping out with event logistics, to emceeing, to speaking, to doing the timing, to doing judge deliberations. Sino came all the way from South Africa to help us as well. Um, and Cullen Pinches is our math system administrator that works all the way through the year as well. And head of the social committee for students at math system this year as well. So a particular shout out to you, Cullen. I also have some flowers for Bronwyn that, because I've been a little bit busy, I didn't manage to organise before today, but luckily my mum's been here sorting out some flowers. She made an arrangement, uh, but I just want to thank you, Bronwyn. Um, yeah, you, you supported me so much. You're an amazing friend. Thank you. We couldn't be more grateful to this amazing group of humans and everybody else who's been working out front, uh, in catering, all around uh, and behind the scenes as well. And uh, thank you all for an amazing week. This is, uh, you know, this is bigger and better than we've ever done before. And uh, we've got big plans for the future. And we can't wait to, to talk more about it. But for now, we're going to release you all into the evening. Thank you again for being part of Map the System 2023. <laughs>